Dia Lupa Dio? What is it? Dua. Dua Lipa. Her name is... I just looked it up today. It's Hungarian or something like that. Um, but that's her actual name. She used to get made fun of it as a kid. And now she's like, no, my name's Dope. And I'm like, hell yeah, it is. Uh, Dua Lipa's fucking new album slaps so hard. And I knew that she was talented. I liked like a few of her songs b- before. Uh, but like, holy shit, this new album is... Now, now I I... When I say this, I'm not, like, a music critic of any kind. I don't know, like, I've written songs and stuff, and I've written song parodies, but and, and I, I compose rap, so I'm not the most technically, like, I don't know how to judge, like, a song song, but, um, so when I say this, take this with a grain of salt, because I judge albums differently than other people. Um, her new album might what is it called future or something uh it's one of my favorite albums now <laughs> of music um because i judge music based on how or I, I i i judge albums rather based on how many songs do i like in it you know um because i very rarely like more than two or three songs on an album. You know, I won't listen. I'll, I'll listen to a whole album and be like, okay, I like these two or whatever, and I pick them out and I put them in my uh, playlist. But Charlie Puth's uh, voice notes is my favorite album because I like all of them but one song. I think, uh, and the and the uh, the last song isn't bad. It's just it hasn't attached to me in a real way. Uh, so that's my favorite album. My second favorite album... Oh, you know what? Technically speaking, if I'm going by that standard, The Black Parade is my favorite album. But right now, in my heart, I don't feel like it's my favorite album, you know? I feel like I latch on more to voice notes. But those are my two favorites. And then Dua Lipa's future... Whatever. I can't remember the name of the actual album now. Uh, is Is number three. Just because I... I'm having a hard time finding a song on the album that I don't like. <laughs> oh. Yeah, um, Love Again and Levitating, you like those ones, Imperious? They're good. I fucking... Cool is really good, too. I don't know if you were here for it, but um, listen to Cool by Dua Lipa. That's, that's one of my favorites. Well, holy shit, like... I was not expecting her to come out with this 80s fucking album. Like, this fucking, this is, this shit is fire. And I don't even like 80s music. Like, I, she, she's, she has crafted it, this pop in a way that even I, like, really enjoy it. And I don't, I don't even, I don't give a shit about 80s music. I was born in 92. I'm an idiot when it comes to music. You're not going to get me to attach it to an 80s album. Oh. God, what a surprise. What a neat surprise in quarantine. Because this album just came out a week ago, and I uh, discovered it by accident, because I think YouTube recommended one of the songs to me. Um, I've also been fucking around on Spotify lately, so... Yeah, that's a fun thing. Oh, also, yeah, if you like... My, I use the, uh, the Rainbow 69 emotes in the chat. Um, if you like those, you should... Let me find uh, my bud Bailey, her streams. If you're a one-tier sub to her, you get a regular 69 emotes and also the rainbow ones, and they're very good. Um, Let's see. I'll link her Twitch in the streams, because you should for sure follow her shit, too, because she is fucking hilarious. And she's been streaming Stardew Valley and Rollercoaster Tycoon recently. Hey, Stark, uh, Star Singer MLP, thank you so much for the follow. Really appreciate it. Uh, oh, no, wait, that's a sub. Thank you so much for the sub. Hell yeah. Uh, dope, dope. Oh, GeForce, did you gift it? Yay. <laughs> GeForce, thank you for uh, gifting Star Singer MLP uh, three, gift, three gift subs in the channel. Hell, you've given three gift subs in the channel. That's fucking dope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, 
<laughs> Let me see. I want to go through um, some of the follows that I haven't said hey to because we were offline. Uh, Sutter Arts, thank you for the follow. Uh, ooh, let's pronounce this. Prince, is it like a prince? I don't know. Prince J, thank you for the follow. Uh, Thornbrain, thank you for the follow. Before the Galaxy, thank you for the follow. The Attacker22, thank you for the follow. Katie Cat 910 thank you for the follow. Thank y'all. Dope. Ah, oh. Y'all, I made a stop reading before we got to see who was at the door. And I know, I know some of y'all were like... No, keep going! Uh, but we'd gone through like six chapters that night. Hell yeah! Cheap already, thank you so much for the sub, really appreciate it. Love your shirt, did the name right. Okay, great, Prince, Prince J? Or Prinick? Oh god, I can't remember how I did it correctly. Did I, did I pronounce the X, or? Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a dumbass. Yeah, this is a shirt that's, um, I think it's from Into the AM. I like their shit. I just ordered another shirt from them with flowers. Because I tweeted about it, but I found a, um, I had a, a Facebook ad for Into the AM. And usually I'm like, wah, uh, I don't like ads. But, uh, for that one, uh, one of the comments was visible and it was just, just like, this fucking white girl that was like, I don't like boys and flowers. And like, that just enraged me. <laughs> Uh, to casually just put like, I don't think men should like wear feminine things because they should, they shouldn't. Uh, so I bought one out of spite, which, uh, I'm letting spite fuel me recently. It's 2020. The first one I just did, lol. Okay. Uh, what did I do? Prince, Prince. Okay. I think I said I did Prince first. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No worries, Rodolphus. It's it's been a time. <laughs> oh, so it's pronounced Prinks. Prinks J. <laughs> I I I find it so interesting how people, you know, how usernames are crafted and how they're pronounced and stuff. Because when I was in 7th or 8th grade, I came up with no whacking, and it just kind of stuck, because that was my name. Uh, so I don't know what I would use as a username if I had to come up with one in 2020, but it wouldn't be that. But, you know, honestly, we'll just keep it, you know? it's You gotta live with your mistakes. <clears throat> um, gonna be going too, but wanted to say hi. Hope you have a good night. Yeah, I hope you have a, a good night too, Rodolphus. You get to have uh, lots of fun dealing with hilariously angry people at GNC. Oh, I bet. Oh, I bet the people who go there are just awful. <laughs> oh, boy. I I had my stint at, uh, you know, public, <clears throat> public service, whatever the fuck it's called. I worked at Olive Garden and ice cream shops, and it's made me so, so grateful for my, for my current job because I don't have to deal with fucking people, or at least... You know, shitty people. I get to deal with, like, Team Four Star now and stuff, and they're cool. <laughs> you know, I keep saying, once I move to Texas, it'll change. But I keep talking about Team Four Star like I'm not a part of Team Four Star. Like, yeah, I've been a part of Team Four Star for four years. You can, you can, you can start saying you're part of the team, Jesse. <laughs> <clears throat> Lol, everyone struggles with my pronunciation, though my old one was cringy, so I prefer the struggle. That's fair. <laughs> Don't worry, I see you, Naruto Sasuke1991. <laughs> yeah, at least there's that. At least my name is no whacking, and it's not like Sasuke69420. Actually, that's a really good name. Fuck it, that's my name now, Sasuke... <laughs> <laughs> We're changing it. <laughs> I kept, I mostly kept my 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 name, so I don't actually have a dead name because Jesse is just Jesse. But um, 
I'm transitioning my other name. No acting, no more. Sasuke69420 will be born from the ash ashes. <laughs> white trash Sasuke. I forgot about white trash Sasuke. Fuck him. We gotta finish Life is Strange too. Um, but I've I've been having fun reading this, and I want to get through. We're about halfway through the book, um, and it's it, and I want to get my Gone Girl video done. So <laughs> Nick Dunn, because that's the name. That's the that's the name. That's the name of the character. Anyway, um, I want to get it done. So if I could just like, this is this is fueling my my i'm coming up with ideas you know as i'm reading and i take notes during it um so i need to just get her done as the truck from car has says he doesn't it's just a it's a joke <laughs> brb right gonna change my name to sasuke 69 420 it's really good yeah whoever gets it first you get it <laughs> <laughs> but that's my name. Not anymore, bish. <laughs> Whoever gets to it first. I mean, there's like multiple. I'm sure there were like eight Katie's in your class or like three Mike's or four Nick's. We can all, we can share names, you know? It's, it's fine. <laughs> I, miss, I missed the last two Gone Girl streams, so I have no idea what's going on. Hooray. Yeah, I'll just abridge it so far. Uh, oh, 69, Sasuke, 69, rainbow emoji, 420, very good. Um, that is a good idea, actually. I should be doing that where I just kind of try to, like, quickly summarize what's happened so far in case people miss streams. I'm trying to upload them as I can, but uh, Kaiser streamed uh, Resident Evil and played the whole game in, like, six hours or something like that, so I've been... I cut up those streams and I've been uploading them uh, to the channel. And when I upload those, I can't upload my own streams because my internet will just fall apart and die. Uh, so I haven't been able to upload any of my Gone Girl streams for, for a bit. But uh, yeah, I will. Uh, I've got two more to upload. <sighs> Pardon me. Uh, so I'll, I'll do that as soon as uploading that shits is done. Um, but yeah, let's, what has happened? Basically, um, in Nick's part of the story, Nick is trying to find Amy and is taking things into his own hands, even though the police are like, hey, stop it. Uh, let us do our job. We're trying to find Amy. He's like, no. And he keeps doing things like he's going to an abandoned mall <laughs> with some fuck boys to help try to find Amy. Hey, Prinks J, thank you so much for the sub. Appreciate it, bud. I like, I redesigned my uh, my shits and I'm, I'm enjoying that. I put gifts and, uh... <laughs> oh boy. Um, but yeah, Nick's trying to like do shit without the police and he's basically trying to solve oh yeah geforce thank you for the geforce is gifted all these subs that's really awesome bud mm. hella cash <laughs> yes yes geforce hella cash um what was i even oh um so nick went to this abandoned mall where the blue book boys are are supposed to hang out the blue book boys um is the name that they give to dudes who used to make... They used to work in this uh, company that made the blue books for, uh, you know, school testing, those things that you use to do tests. Sorry. My nose isn't running. It's just itchy, I swear, but it looks weird. Um, and, uh, you know, the town's been going under, so everyone's losing their jobs. So there's, like, homeless people who used to work there who live in this abandoned mall. And they go there trying to find them uh to see if they know where amy is and nick shows a picture to one of the guys in charge and the guy's like oh shit yeah no i know amy because she came to try to buy a gun on valentine's day and i think nick has kept that a secret from the police he's basically trying to like do everything himself which is you know 
honorable in most cases because fuck cops, but also he's a piece of shit. So everyone's just a piece of shit. <laughs> Nick being Nick, basically. Yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good summary of it. Uh, so he has gone to his sister's place. Uh, he's staying there in the meantime. She's like, well, I'm going to go to bed. He stayed up. And this whole time, uh, Nick has had a disposable. And I've tried not to draw too much attention to it because I want y'all to, like, discover things on your own. But Nick has had a disposable phone that keeps ringing. Um, and we haven't actually seen him talk to whoever's on the other end or text because he keeps calling them. They're not answering. And then they try to call him and he's in a, a public place and can't answer it. So right before we had ended for the night, Nick, uh, the last line in Nick's story was in my pocket, my disposable cell phone made a mini jackpot sound that meant I had a text. I'm outside. Open the door. And I'm outside, open the door, I want to note, has no punctuation or anything, it's all lowercase and it's all one sentence. I'm outside, open the door. Then we got a one, two, three, a three page entry from Amy, where she basically um, is talking about how she's taking care of Nick's mom for him. Like Nick was like, yeah, we got to move to to take care so i can take care of my parents and then he gets there and it's just like super absent and now amy's having to do all the work oh uh so i've been watching a lot of your old videos and they've inspired me in ways i can't even imagine where i'm in a situation where i feel like i've lost it all specifically your old being confident video it's really lit a fire under me, and I just want to say thanks. It was a little heart. Thank you so much. That's I'm I'm really glad that I'm able to uh, help you. That's super dope. <laughs> Hell yeah. Nick seems like he's only trying to find Amy because it's expected of him. Yeah, that's the that's my main that you're that you n hit the nail on the head. That's my issue with, um, you know, normally I'd be like, yeah, fuck cops. We gotta like do this on our own because they're not gonna like do it. But Nick doing it is. He's treated Amy like shit for so long, and now you're trying to find her. Okay, you know, that's uh, that's a that's a good summary of my feelings. I'm trying a new coffee that uh, is supposed to taste like banana fosters from Bones. Bones, it's dang good. Yeah, he definitely feels like a person that's going through the motions. Yeah, he's um. I don't think he's learned. Yeah, no, he hasn't. Through his language, you can tell he hasn't learned. Like, I'm a piece of shit. Uh, he's just like, yeah, I feel bad that I wasn't nicer to my wife. Anyway, I'm going to find my wife so I can not be nice to her again. <laughs> Zoned out for a second. Heard Nick was trying to keep it from the police and my mind jumped to Lanny. <laughs> oh, did that episode of... Um, I know there's been episodes of... Uh, unabridged that have been coming out every Saturday where uh, Lainey's character is just kind of like chaotic and I, I love that uh, but yeah oh God, I love unabridged I'm, I'm so glad people are enjoying it because it's uh, it's for sure one of my favorite things that that we've produced as Team Four Star and I didn't get to like have a part in it whether it's writing or, or being in it would have been cool but next season I'm I'm gonna be vying for it because like I love content that inspires me and makes me super excited to make content. And I hadn't seen anything of Unabridged until I think I think a couple months ago. Uh, and then all the episodes were on our drive. So I was like, we were talking about it in a meeting. Uh, and I just saw it sitting there. I was like, I guess I'll watch it. And I ended up having a fucking fantastic time because it's so goddamn funny. I watched the episodes out of order. I think I saw episode... I saw the coffee one first, um, which came out, I, I forget if it, it's, I forget what episode it is, but it's not the first one. Um, I watched them out of order and was like, I messaged Stefan because I knew that Stefan did writing on it. It was like, dude, this is like so fucking good. This is really good. Um, and 
I took a look at the scripts and stuff. Uh, it's a fun exercise because I got to uh, read the script for episode one and then saw episode one. So I got to see what changes were made and um, stuff like that and just compare and contrast the scenes and stuff. And the episode that's... And I got to see uh, scenes that didn't actually uh, make it in or alternative scenes like season... or. Uh, the, the first scene in episode one was supposed to be very different, but what they put in is way better. Uh, the final episode one is the best version of it, and sometimes you don't get that. But I guess because we're content creators making the shit we have for a say in it, and we're able to do that. But sometimes you uh, you watch a movie, and then you see deleted scenes and, and, and alternative endings and alternative things, and you're like, this was way better. Why did they go with this? Uh, we had the opportunity to not do that, because... We just we could just make it whatever we want, which is super cool. Uh, so there's so much freedom in that, and that excites me. You know, uh, it got me excited to to work on my own shit. So that's why I've been working on my original series and stuff, and I've been feeling really good about it recently. But I'm glad people are liking it on bridge so much. <sighs> Episode two, the kidnapping. Yes. Oh yeah, Nick's been acting inconvenienced by the whole situation. Yeah. Wait, oh wait, uh, Nick's been acting inconvenienced by the whole situation. Is that from an episode, or are you talking about, like, in general? Because <laughs> I read the sentences out of order. <laughs> it's amazing, full laughs, yeah. My favorite of that episode is when he leaves him at the... M <laughs> yes, that is so fucking funny. Oh my god. I... The whole plot line with, uh, Kieran and Grant, where they're trying to make him, like, a web thing um a web star was like apparently like just completely improv and that's like that's so funny because uh kieran and grant are great at that they have great chemistry together and you can just like let them go and they'll just like come up with something great which is what i love about them oh that was in the book okay so nick being yes nick feels inconvenienced by the whole situation um yeah like it's not Nick, as a character, doesn't experience real empathy, and I feel like that's what fucks me up about him, is everything that he says, his inner monologue and everything, you're like, you don't really give a shit, do you? This is just how your wife's disappearance affects you. Which is just how Nick's brain works. It's funny, I'm working with a lot of Nicks. I've been, um... Uh, I've been seeing a non-binary cutie who, uh, their name is Nick, with a K, just N-I-K. Uh, then we have Nick Dunn, and then we also have Lanny Nick. I'm just doing a lot of, a lot of Nicks. <laughs> oh, I got a little Norton security alert going, thank you. <laughs> Everything Nick does feels very self-serving. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So why should we like douche Nick? Why should we? Why should we? That's the question. Let's keep reading and see. <laughs> we might not come up with anything. <clears throat> Nick Dunn. Four days gone. She was standing there in the orange glow of the streetlight in a flimsy sundress, her hair wavy from the humidity. Andy. She rushed to the doorway, her arms splayed to hug me, and I hissed, Wait, wait and shut the door just before she wrapped herself around me. She pressed her cheek against my chest, and I put my hand on her bare back and closed my eyes. I felt a queasy mixture of relief and horror when you finally stop and itch and realize it's because you've ripped a hole in your skin. I have a mistress. Now is the part where I have to tell you I have a, a mistress and you stop liking me. If you liked me to begin with, I have a pretty young, very young mistress, and her name is Andy. I know. It's bad. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess, I guess there's no reason to like Nick. <laughs> I guess there's really no reason to like Nick. <laughs> I guess he's just kind of a piece of shit. <laughs> I love how that's written. I love how it's written. I love that it says, um, 
I have a mistress. Now is the part where I have to tell you I have a mistress and you stop liking me. If you liked me to begin with. Um. Hashtag kick Nick's dick. Kick Nick's dick. Just kick it. It's gone. Doesn't deserve it. Doesn't deserve it. Why am I a good upstanding trans man without a cis penis? And this piece of shit gets one and just uses it so poorly. I would do so much good with that penis, Nick. Amy even says it's a big penis. <laughs> oh, don't worry, Nick. None of us liked you from the start. <laughs> <laughs> yes wait no <laughs> yeah it's bad this is bad it's bad it's bad let's continue <laughs> good dick terrible person attached to said dick <laughs> uh, god how am i gonna voice andy <sighs> Baby, why the fuck haven't you called me? She said, her face still pressed against me. I know, sweetheart, I know. You just can't imagine. It's been a nightmare. How did you find me? She held on to me. Your house was dark, so I figured try goes. Andy knew my habits. Knew my... Hmm? Andy knew my habits. Knew my... Oh, habitats. <laughs> Andy knew my... Oh, <laughs> lower. <laughs> Andy knew my habits. Knew my habitats. We've been together a while. I have a pretty, very young mistress, and we've been together a while. I was worried about you, Nick. Frantic. I'm sitting at Maddie's house, and the TV is like, oh yeah. She's fairly young. I think she's like 19 or something. I'm going to give her kind of a valley thing. I was worried about you, Nick. Frantic. I'm sitting at Maddie's house, and the TV is like just on. And all of a sudden, on the TV, I see this like guy who looks like you talking about his missing wife and then i realize it is you can you imagine how freaked out i was and you didn't even try to reach me i called you don't say anything sit tight don't say anything till we talk that's an order that's not you trying to reach me i haven't been alone much people have been around me all the time amy's parents go the police i breathed into her hair amy's just gone she asked she's just gone She's just gone, girl. <laughs> there was a successful dick transplant not that long ago. Good. Let's fucking, let's find him. It'll be gone dick. That's the sort of science I could get behind. How did this prick even get one girl to like him? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how young is this girl? I don't want to say yet. Uh, in the movie... I believe she's 19 or 20, uh, but we'll see how she how old she is in the book. Um, she's, she's, just, she's just gone. I pulled myself from her and sat down on the couch, and she sat beside me, her leg pressed against mine, her arm brushing against mine. Someone took her. Nick, are you okay? Her chocolatey hair fell in waves over her chin, collarbone, breasts, and I watched one single strand shake in the stream of her breathing. No, not really. I gave her the shh sign and pointed toward the hallway. My sister. We sat side by side, silent, the TV flickering, the old cop show, the men in fedoras making an arrest. I felt her hand w wriggle into mine. She leaned into me as if we were settling in for a movie night, some lazy, carefree couple, and then she pulled my face toward her and kissed me. Andy, no, I whispered. Yes, I need you. She kissed me again and climbed onto my lap, where she straddled me, her cotton dress slipping up around her knees, one of her flip-flops falling to the floor. Nick, I've been so worried about you. I need to feel your hands on me. That's all I've been thinking about. I'm scared. Andy was a physical girl, and that's not code for it's all about the sex. She was a hugger, a toucher. She was prone to running her fingers through my hair or down my back in a friendly scratch. She got reassurance and comfort from touching. And yes, fine, she also liked sex. With one quick tug, she yanked down the top of her sundress and moved my hands onto her breasts. My canine loyal lust surfaced. 
Of course it did, Nick. Fucking, of course. <laughs> um, let's see. I want to fuck you. I almost said aloud. You are warm, my wa Oh, yes, okay. I want to fuck you. I almost said aloud. You are warm, my wife said in my ear. I lurched away. I was so tired, the room was swimming. Nick? Her bottom lip was wet with my spit. What? Are we not okay? Is it because of Amy? Andy had always felt young. She was 23. Of course she felt young. But right then I realized how grotesquely young she was, how irresponsibly, disastrously young she was. Okay, maybe she isn't 19 in the movie, but I, she's, uh, she, I remember she's young, because she's like college. She was 23. She was 23. Ruinously young. Hearing my wife's name on her lips was always jar... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, hearing my wife's name on her lips always jarred me. She said it a lot. She liked to discuss Amy, as if Amy were the heroine on a nighttime soap opera. Andy never made Amy the enemy. She made her a character. She asked questions, all the time, about our life together, about Amy. What did you guys do together in New York? Like, what did you do on the weekends? Andy's mouth went, oh, once... Oh. Andy's mouth went, oh, like, oh, not O-H, just like an O shape. Uh, once when I told her about going to the opera. You went to the opera? What did she wear? Full length? And a wrap or a fur? And her jewelry? And her hair? Also, what were Amy's friends like? What did we talk about? What was Amy like? What was Amy like? Like, really like? Was she like the girl in the books? Perfect? It was Andy's favorite bedtime story, Amy. My sister is in the other room, sweetheart. You shouldn't, have, you, you shouldn't even be here. God, I want you here, but you really shouldn't have come, babe, I, until we know what we're dealing with. You are brilliant, you are witty, you are warm. Now kiss me. That's from the, um, what's it called? The, 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 the clue, in case you needed a refresher, because it's written in italics in all caps. He had dick privileges? Who allowed this? Who allowed it? Dick privileges revoked. <laughs> That's it. He loses dick privileges. Uh, Andy remained atop me, her breasts out, nipples going hard from the air conditioning. Baby, w wait, is this her? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Baby, what we're dealing with right now is I need to make sure we're okay. That's all I need. She pressed against me, warm and lush. That's all I need. Please, Nick, I'm freaked out. I know you. I know you won't, You don't want to talk right now, and that's fine, but I need you to be with me. And I wanted to kiss her then, the way I had that very first time. Our teeth bumping, her face tilted to mine, her hair tickling my arms. A wet and tonguey kiss, me thinking of nothing but the kiss, because it would be dangerous to think of anything but how good it felt. The only thing that kept me from dragging her into the bedroom now was not how wrong it was, it had been many shades of wrong all along, but now that it was actually dangerous. And because there was Amy. Finally, there was Amy, that voice that had made its home in my ear for half a decade, my wife's voice, but now it wasn't chiding, it was sweet again. I hated that three... I hated that three little notes from my wife could make me feel this way, soggy and sentimental. I had absolutely no right to be sentimental. Andy was burrowing into me, and I was wondering if the police had Go's house under surveillance, if I should be listening for a knock at the door. I have a very young, very pretty mistress. My mother had always told her kids, If you're about to do something, and you want to know if it's a bad idea, imagine seeing it printed in the paper for all the world to see. Nick Dunn, a one-time magazine writer still pride-wounded from a 2010 layoff, agreed to teach a journalism class for North Carthage Junior College. The older married man promptly exploited his position by launching a torrid fuckfest with an affair, uh, of an affair with one of his impressionable young students. I was the embodiment of every writer's worst fear. 
a cliche. Now let me string some more cliches together for your amusement. It happened gradually. I never meant to hurt anyone. I got in deeper than I thought I would. But it was more than a fling. It was more than an ego boost. I really love Andy. I do. The class I was teaching, How to Launch a Magazine Career, contained 14 students of varying degrees of skill. All girls. I'd say women, but I think girls is factually correct. They all wanted to work in magazines. They weren't smudgy newsprint girls, they were glossies. They'd seen the movie. They pictured themselves dashing around Manhattan, latte in one hand, cell phone in the other, adorably breaking a designer heel while hailing a cab, and falling into the arms of a charming, disarming soulmate with winningly floppy hair. They had no clue about how foolish, how ignorant their choice of a major was. I'd been planning on telling them as much, using my layoff as a cautionary tale, although I had no interest in being the tragic figure. I pictured delivering the story nonchalantly, jokingly. No big deal. More time to work on my novel. Then I spent the first class answering so many awestruck questions, and I turned into such a preening gas bag, such a needy fuck, that I couldn't bear to tell the real story. The call into the managing editor's office on the second round of layoffs, the hiking of that doomed path t down the long rows of cubicles, all eyes shifting toward me, dead man walking, me still hoping I was going to be told something different, that the magazine needed me now than ever, yes! It would be a buck-up speech, an all-hands-on-deck speech. But, no. My boss just said, I guess you know, unfortunately, why I called you in here, rubbing his eyes under his glasses to show how weary and dejected he was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really have a feeling this guy's a pedophile. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, like... Even he knows, right? Because he just said, I'd like to say women, but I think girls is factually correct. Like, they're... If... if, Yeah, I don't know. It's it's a cliche that, that uh, you know, older men want to go for a younger woman because, like, they're married, and then they're like, ah, we got to trade it in for a newer model. So it might just be that. But, like, how young this girl is. Like, he should know better. And, God, I hate Nick. <sighs> I wanted to feel like a shiny, cool winner, so I didn't tell my students about my demise. I told them we had a family illness that required my attention here. Which was true. Yes, I told myself. Entirely true. And very heroic. And pretty, freckled Andy sat a few feet in front of me. Wide-set blue eyes under chocolatey waves of hair. Cushiony lips parted just a bit, ridiculously large, real breasts, and long, thin legs and arms. An alien fuck doll of a girl, it must be said, as different from my elegant patrician wife as could be. And Andy was radiating body heat and lavender, clicking notes on her laptop, asking questions in a husky voice like, How did you get a source to trust you, to open up to you? And I thought to myself right then, where the fuck did this girl come from? Is this a joke? You ask yourself, why? I'd been faithful to Amy always. I was the guy who left the bar early if a woman was getting too flirty, if her touch was feeling too nice. I was not a cheater. I don't... didn't? Like cheaters. Dishonest, disrespectful, petty, spoiled. I never succumbed. But that was back when I was happy. I hate to think the answer is that easy, but I had been happy all my life, and now I was not, and Andy was there, lingering after class, asking me questions about myself that Amy never had, not lately, making me feel like a worthwhile man, not the idiot who lost his job, the dope who forgot to put the toilet seat down, the blunderer who just could never quite get it right, whatever it was. Andy brought me an apple one day, a red delicious. Uh, title of the memoir of our affair, if I were to write one. She asked me to give her story an early look. It was a profile of a stripper at a St. Louis club, and it read like a, pen a penthouse forum piece. And Andy began eating my apple while I read it, leaning over my shoulder, the juice sitting ludicrously on her lip. And then I thought, holy shit, this girl is trying to seduce me. Foolishly shocked, an aging Benjamin Braddock. 
It worked. I began thinking of Andy as an escape, an opportunity, an option. I'd come home to find Amy in a tight ball on the sofa, Amy staring at the wall, silence, never saying the first word to me, always waiting, a perpetual game of ice-breaking, a constant mental challenge. What will make Amy happy today? I would think Andy wouldn't do that, as if I knew Andy. Andy would laugh at that joke. Andy would like that story. Andy was a nice, pretty, bosomy Irish girl from my hometown, unassuming and jolly. Andy sat in the front row of my class, and she looked soft, and she looked interested. When I thought about Andy, my stomach didn't hurt the way it did with my wife, the constant dread of returning to my own home, where I wasn't welcome. I began imagining how it might happen. I began craving her touch. Yes, it was like that, just like a lyric from a, ba from a bad 80s single. I craved her touch. I craved touch in general, because my wife avoided mine. At home, she slipped past me like a fish, sliding just out of grazing distance in the kitchen or the stairwell. We watched TV silently on our two sofa cushions, as separate as if they were life rafts. In bed, she turned away from me, pushed blankets and sheets between us. I once woke up in the night and, knowing she was asleep, pulled aside her halter strap a bit and pressed my cheek and a palm against her bare shoulder. I couldn't get back to sleep that night. I was so disgusted with myself. I got out of bed and masturbated in the shower, picturing Amy, the lusty way she used to look at me, those heavy-lidded moonrise eyes taking me in, making me feel seen. When I was done, I sat down in the bathtub and stared at the drain through the spray. My penis lay pathetically along my left thigh like some small animal washed ashore. I sat at the bottom of the bathtub, humiliated, trying not to cry. Okay. <laughs> it's really hard to stay in character when I hate the character so much. Oh, God. Oh, yeah, for sure, Andrew. <laughs> Oh my god. Because, like... I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say. On its own, if you were just to read that section, you'd be like, aw, poor Nick. But knowing everything about him, he just made his bed. You know what I mean? Like, no one asked you to be a total dick to your wife so like they're in a relationship he's a huge piece of shit she stops like trying she stopped because he's a huge piece of shit and she makes him sad and then he's like why won't my wife like touch me anymore why is she such a bitch all the time now i have to go jerk off in the shower because i feel so bad remember when she used to be nice to me i'm, I'm just i hate him so much i hate He's so poor me. He created this problem. He created a problem and then got sad about it. He wants to be the victim in a story where he instigates every relationship problem. Yeah, exactly. That's the... Ugh. It's, it's so bad. It's so bad. So, it happened. In a strange, sudden snowstorm in early April. Not April of this year. April of last year. So he's been having this affair for a while. I was working the bar alone because Go was having a mom night. We took turns not working, staying home with our mother and watching bad TV. Our mom was going fast. She wouldn't last the year, not even close. Ooh, you know what, actually. I want to write down a thingy. I'm I I'm glad this is inspiring notes, you know, because like I said, I um I like that this is like making me excited to work on my video again. Oh, here we go. I was actually feeling okay right at that moment. My mom and Go were snuggled up at home watching an Annette Funicello beach movie, and the bar had had a busy, lively night. One of those nights where everyone seemed to have come off a good day. Pretty girls were nice to homely guys. People were buying rounds for strangers just because. It was festive. And then it was the end of the night. Time to close. Everybody out. 
I was about to lock the door when Andy flung it wide and stepped in almost on top of me, and I could smell the light beer sweetness on her breath, the scent of wood smoke in her hair. I paused for that jarring moment when you try to process someone you've seen in only one setting, but put them in a new context. Andy in the bar. Okay. She laughed a pirate wench laugh and pushed me back inside. I just had the most fantastically awful date, and you have to have a drink with me. Snowflakes gathered in the dark waves of her hair. Her sweet scattering of freckles glowed. Her cheeks were bright pink, as if someone had double-slapped her. She has this great voice, this fuzzy duckling voice, that starts out ridiculously cute and ends up completely sexy. Please, Nick, I've got to get that bad date, ta bad date taste out of my mouth. I remember us laughing and thinking what a relief it was to be with a woman and hear her laugh. She was wearing jeans and a cashmere v-neck. She is one of those girls who look better in jeans than a dress. Her face, her body, is casual in the best way. I assumed my position behind the bar and she slid onto a bar stool, her eyes assessing all the liquor bottles behind me. What do you want, lady? Surprise me, she said. Boo, I said the word leaving my lips kiss puckered. Now surprise me with a drink. She leaned forward so her cleavage was levered, uh, leveraged against the bar, her breast pushed upwards. If, if Nick could stop mentioning her breasts for like five seconds, that'd be super cool. That'd be super fucking cool. I love how um, Gillian, Jake, uh, Gillian Flynn captures this, though, because like... Nick is would absolutely talk about her breasts so much. He ta he obsesses over that. Like any woman that enters the room, he has to talk about her boobs, all of them. <laughs> Even like the cops, it's so bad. But that's uh yeah. <laughs> it's so chilling hearing him describe someone that he earlier described as a girl as a sexual prospect. Huge yikes. Yeah, it's oof. She does her, uh, Gillian does a really good job of making you hate Nick. Um, it's so, it's capturing his voice. It, uh, it's kind of, um, I aspire to this because right now I'm writing, uh, characters that I hate in the project that I'm working on. And, uh, I'm like, I want my dialogue to make me cringe as much as this does. So I'm aspiring to that. Jeez, Nick, what about her ass? Yeah, can you, can you talk more about that? Because, like... <laughs> Oof. Yeah. Uh, um, what was I even... I was going to say something, and then I totally forgot what it was. Let's continue. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, here we go. Oh, I was in the middle of... That's why. I was in the middle of a paragraph. She wore a pendant on a thin gold chain. The pendant slid between her breasts down under her sweater. Okay, so yeah, he just mentioned her breasts in the last sentence. She's, he's talking about the breasts more. Uh, don't be that guy, I thought. The guy who pants over... The guy who pants over where the pendant ends. What flavor you feel like, I asked. Whatever you give me, I'll like. It was that line that caught me, the simplicity of it. The idea that I could do something and it would make a woman happy and it would be easy. Whatever you give me, I'll like. I felt an overwhelming wave of relief and then I knew I didn't love Amy anymore. I don't love my wife anymore, I thought, turning to grab two tumblers, not even a little bit. I am wiped clean of love, I am spotless. I made my favorite drink, Christmas morning, hot coffee and cold peppermint schnapps. I had one with her. Oh, that sounds that sounds good. I had one with her, and then she and when she shivered and laughed, the big whoop of a laugh. I poured us another round. We drank together an hour past closing time, and I mentioned the word wife three times because I was looking at Andy and picturing taking her clothes off. A warning for her, the least I could do. I have a wife. Do with that what you will. She sat in front of me her chin in her hands, smiling up at me. Walk me home, 
she said. She'd mentioned before how close she lived to downtown, how she needed to stop by the bar sometime and say hello. And did she mention how close she lived to the bar? My mind had been primed. Many times I'd mentally strolled the few blocks toward the bland brick apartments where she lived. So when I suddenly was out the door walking her home, it didn't seem unusual at all. There wasn't that warning bell that told me, this is unusual, this is not what we do. I walked her home, against the wind, snow flying everywhere, helping her rewrap her red-knitted scarf once, twice, and on the third time I was tucking her in properly and our faces were close and her cheeks were a merry holiday sledding pink and it was the kind of thing that could never have happened in another hundred nights, but that night it was possible. The conversation, the booze, the storm, the scarf. We grabbed each other at the same time, me pushing her up against a tree for better leverage, the spindly branches dumping a pile of snow on us, a stunning, comical moment that only made me more insistent on touching her, touching everything at once, one hand up inside her sweater, the other between her legs, and her letting me. She pulled back from me, her teeth chattering. Come up with me. I paused. Come up with me, she said. I want to be with you. Oh, so that's like, that's like a repeat of the, I want to be with you is like kind of her like, uh, I hate Nick. I hate Nick. Yeah, she's 23. She can, she can be in a bar, but like, oof. <sighs> the sex wasn't that great. Not the first time. Yeah, cause like, you guys were, like, drinking. Jesus. Uh, we were two bodies used to different rhythms, never quite getting the hang of each other, and it had been so long since I'd been inside a woman, I came first, quickly, and kept moving, 30 crucial seconds as I began wilting inside her, just long enough to get her taken care of before I went entirely slack. So it was nice, but disappointing. Anticlimactic. The way girls must feel when they give up their virginity. That was what all the fuss was about? But I liked how she wrapped herself around me, and I liked that she was as soft as I'd imagined. New skin. Young, I thought disgracefully, picturing Amy and her constant lotioning, sitting in bed and slapping away at herself angrily. I went into Andy's bathroom, took a piss, looked at myself in the mirror, and made myself say it. You are a cheater. You have failed one of the most basic male tests. You are not a good man. And when that didn't bother me, I thought... You're really not a good man. I'm going to write that down because I'm going to... One forty-nine bottom of the page. Bootum, I wrote. Bottom. There we go. Yeah, this is, um, he's, uh, yeah, he's fucking Andy, so she's 22, 22 or 23, and was in his, uh, class. So yes, this is the same person. <laughs> he knows nothing, there are precautions so you don't come first, oral first, then go in, it's basic fuck science. Yeah, I had, I get the feeling that, uh... Well, that's interesting. Yeah, he should have. At least in the movie, there's a scene where um, the first time Amy and Nick have sex, he's going down on her, and they make a point of showing that. So he knows how to do it. I guess, I guess he just like was a piece of shit and just really wanted to like be inside her. Yeah, no, she's not actually a kid. She's 22 or 23, but, like, she's young, like, for him, who's probably, I don't know how old Nick, oh, they said how old Nick was. He's in his 30s. I don't know. Too old. <laughs> I think he's, like, 36 or something. 
which I guess in itself isn't terrible. Because, you know, I've, I was, um, how old was I? I was 22 or 23, and I was with, like, a 31-year-old or a 32-year-old once having sex. And that's not bad, you know, it's just creepy in this context, I feel. <laughs> yeah, basically, like, the way that I operate with sex is, um, I like, I'm like a one and done type of dude. I, I, I finish and, like, I'm good, you know, I don't really want to keep having sex after that. So I take care of the other person first for that reason. Uh, so, you know, yeah, just, like, go down on her first Make sure she's taken care of. Uh, but that's... The, yeah, that's... Because, <laughs> like... Delaying it as much as possible, you know, if you're gonna... You're just gonna come early if you just, like, go inside her. You know. You finish and say, that's dope. Yes, I do. That's the... <laughs> if you saw my video today, Pink Blue Episode 11 came out, and... Oh, boy. I need to stop it. I need to stop saying that was dope after I come. It's so, it's embarrassing. It doesn't make me feel bad. It just makes me feel bad. You know what I mean? It doesn't make me feel bad. It makes me feel bad. Like, <laughs> God. Yeah, so long as there is knowledge and consent within legal bounds without it being fetishized in a creepy way, bang away. Exactly. But Nick is like... He's fetishizing this way too much. He keeps being like, she's so young. Like, I don't like it. I don't like that. We don't like you saying that, Nick. The horrifying thing was, if the sex had been outrageously mind-blowing, there might have been my sole indiscretion. But it was only decent, and now I was a cheater, and I, couldn't, and I couldn't ruin my record of fidelity on something merely average. So I knew there would be a next. I didn't promise myself never again. And then the next was very, very good, and the next after that was great. Soon Andy became a physical counterpoint to all things Amy. She laughed with me and made me laugh. She didn't immediately contradict me or second-guess me. She never scowled at me. She was easy. It was all so fucking easy. And I thought, love makes you want to be a better man. Right, right. But maybe love, real love, also gives you permission to just be the man you are. Ah, fuck you, Nick. <laughs> I was going to tell Amy. I knew it had to happen. I continued not to tell Amy for months and months. And then more months. Most of it was cowardice. I couldn't bear to have the conversation, to have to explain myself. I couldn't imagine having to discuss the divorce with Rand and Mary Beth, as they certainly would insert themselves into the fray. But part of it, in truth, was my strong streak of pragmatism. It was almost grotesque, how practical, self-serving, I could be. I hadn't asked Amy for a divorce, in part because Amy's money had financed the bar. She basically owned it. She would certainly take it back and I couldn't bear to look at my twin trying to be brave as she lost another couple of years of her life. So I let myself drift, drift on in the miserable situation, assuming that at some point Amy would take charge. Amy would demand a divorce, and then I would get to be the good guy. I'm writing that paragraph down also. <laughs> This desire to escape the situation without blame was despicable. The more despicable I became, the more I craved Andy, who knew that I wasn't as bad as I seemed if my story were published in the paper for strangers to read. Amy will divorce you, I kept thinking. She can't let it linger on much longer. But as spring faded away and summer came, then fall, 
than winter, and I became a cheating man of all seasons, a cheat with a pleasantly impatient mistress. It became clear that something would have to be done. I mean, I love you, Nick, Andy said, here, severely on my sister's sofa. No matter what happens, I don't really know what else to say. I feel pretty... She threw her hands up. Stupid. Don't feel stupid, I said. I don't know what to say either. There's nothing to say. You can say that you love me no matter what happens. I thought I can't say that out loud anymore. I'd said it once or twice, a spitty mumble against her neck, homesick for something. But the words were out there, and so was a lot more. I thought then of the trail we'd left, our busy, semi-hidden love affair that I hadn't worried enough about. If her building had a security camera, I was on it. I bought a disposable phone just for her calls, but those voicemails and texts went to her... Oh, where is that? But those voicemails and texts went to her very permanent cell. I'd written her a dirty valentine that I could already see splashed across the news, me rhyming besot with twat. And more, Andy was 23. I assumed my words, my voice, even photos of me were captured on various electronica. I'd flip through the photos on her phone one night, jealous, possessive, curious, and seen plenty of shots of an ex or two smiling proudly in her bed, and I assumed at one point I'd join the club. I kind of wanted to join the club, and for some reason that hadn't worried me, even though it could be downloaded and sent to a million people in the space of a vengeful second. Wait a minute, Nick, hold on. You went through her phone? Uh... <sighs> okay. Keep going. No, you know what? No, I have to write that down. <laughs> Hmm. Let's see. This is an extremely weird situation, Andy. I just need you to be patient. She pulled back from me. You can't say you love me no matter what happens? I love you, Andy. I do. I held her eyes, saying I love you was dangerous right now, but, she, but so was not saying it. Fuck me, then. She whispered. She began tugging at my belt. We have to be real careful right now. I... It's a bad, bad place for me if the police find out about us. It looks beyond bad. That's what you're worried about? I'm a man with a missing wife and a secret... Girlfriend. Yeah, it looks bad. It looks criminal. That makes it sound sleazy. Her breasts were still out. People don't know us, Andy. They will think it's sleazy. God, it's like some bad noir movie. I smiled. I'd introduced Andy to noir, to Boggart, and The Big Sleep, Double Indemnity, all the classics. It was one of the things I liked best about us, that I could show her things. Oh my god. Yeah, I just... You just want a blank slate, bud. You just want someone who won't complain and won't, like, challenge you in any way. Why don't we just tell the police, she said. Wouldn't that be better? No, Andy, don't even think about it. No. They're going to find out why. Why would they? Have you told anyone about us, sweetheart? She gave me a twitchy she gave me a twitchy look. I felt bad. This was not how she thought the night would go. She had been excited to see me. She had been imagining a lusty reunion, physical reassurance, and I was busy covering my ass. Sweetheart, I'm sorry, I just need to know. I said. Not by name. What do you mean, not by name? I mean, she said, pulling up her dress finally. My friends, my mom, they know I'm seeing someone. Not by name. And not by any kind of description, right? I said it more urgently than I wanted to, feeling like I was holding up a collapsing ceiling. Two people know about this, Andy. You and me. If you help me, if you love me, it will just be us knowing, and then the police will never find out. 
She traced a finger along my jawline. And what if... if they never find Amy? You and I, Andy, will be together no matter what happens. But only if we're careful. If we're not careful, it's possible... It looks bad enough that I could go to prison. Maybe she ran off with someone, she said, leaning her cheek against my shoulder. Maybe... I could feel her girl brain buzzing, turning Amy's disappearance into a frothy, scandalous romance, ignoring any reality that didn't suit the narrative. But you just you had to say girl brain, huh? You had to say it, it like that. She didn't run off. It's much more serious than that. I put a finger under her chin so she looked at me. Andy, I need you to take this very seriously, okay? Of course I'm taking it seriously, but I need to be able to talk to you more often, to see you. I'm freaking out, Nick. We just need to sit tight for now. I gripped both her shoulders so, so she had to look at me. My wife is missing, Andy. But you don't even... I knew what she was about to say. You don't even love her, but she was smart enough to stop. She put her arms around me. Look, I don't want to fight. I know you care about Amy, and I know you must be really worried. I am too. I know you are under... I can't imagine the pressure. So I'm fine keeping an even lower profile than I did before, if that's possible. But remember, this affects me too. I need to hear from you. Once a day. Just call when you can, even if it's only for a few seconds, so I can hear your voice. Once a day, Nick. Every single day. I'll go crazy otherwise. I'll go crazy. She smiled at me, whispered, Now kiss me. I kissed her very softly. I love you, she said, and I kissed her neck and mumbled my reply. We sat in silence, the TV flickering. I let my eyes close. Now kiss me. Who had said that? It's in case you word picking up on that uh now kiss me is what amy said at the end of her letter uh from the last clue yeah it's interesting because like oh yeah uh andy is spelled with an ie for y'all because uh you can't see it but uh yeah it's an ie uh so you spelled it correctly the first time <laughs> so you're good um, yeah, I, uh, I'm trying to figure out what I think of a Andy, because Andy, in the movie, the movie plays more to, to Nick not being a huge asshole, and Andy seems more bimbo-y in the movie, if that makes sense. In the book, she seems perfectly fine to me. Um, I think she's just young and naive and is attracted to Nick, you know. So I honestly don't think that she's terrible. Which is interesting that they made her less likable in the movie. But with this, it just seems like she's, you know, uh... Maybe it's because I'm assigned female birth so I can relate to it more, but there's a, there's a, the way that Nick is describing when he goes through her phone, yikes, um, with the pictures of exes, I get the feeling Andy hasn't been treated very well, uh, by men, and then she sees this teacher who is seemingly handsome and successful, and find, she finds him attractive, and he's in the industry that she wants to be in, and, and it can kind of trick you into being into him, you know? And he takes advantage of that. He needs to be the adult and be like, no, we can't do this. Uh, and then she'll learn later, and then she'll be embarrassed when she's, like, you know, 30 and married and later down the line and be like, God, I can't believe I had the hots for my teacher. Good thing someone stopped that. But he didn't. Uh, so... That's my opinion on Andy. I like her more. I didn't like her in the movie as much. Uh, and now I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm somewhat relating to her. She seems like she's early in her romantic life and no one knows what love is at that time. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that's a, that's a good assessment of it. Yeah. 
Because, like, she's doing the things that um, everyone else her age in her friend group are doing. You know, she's dressing a certain way, and it's... Uh, I can't figure out if it's for herself or it's just because she thinks that's what she's supposed to do, you know. But I think she's just young and naive, and she's not... No one... Nick needed to say no, and uh, and he didn't. So... Let's see. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I lurched awake just after 5 a.m. Go was up. I could hear her down the hall running water in the bathroom. I shook Andy. It's 5 a.m. It's 5 a.m. And with promises of love and phone calls, I hustled her toward the door like a shameful one-nighter. Remember, call every day, Andy whispered. I heard the bathroom door open. Every day, I said, and ducked behind the door as I opened it and Andy left. When I turned back around, Go was standing in the living room. Her mouth had dropped open, stunned, but the rest of her body was in full fury, hands on hips, eyebrows veed. Nick, you fucking idiot. Oof. I like uh, the reveal better in uh, the movie. Because um, in the movie, they fuck. I don't know if they actually had sex. Oh, I think they did. Because she said, now kiss me. Well, no, he kissed her very softly. I don't know if they actually had sex. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think they had sex in this. In the movie, she comes over and they have sex. And then they fall asleep. Uh, Nick wakes up and is like, shit, what time is it? You gotta go. And he isn't hearing uh, Margot at all. He just rushes her out. He's like, pull up your dress. You know, you gotta go because they've had sex. Um, she gets dressed, pushes her out the door, and then shuts it. And then from behind Nick, you hear go, go, go say, you fucking idiot, or whatever she says. Uh, that's a better reveal, in my opinion. Uh, and it really shows, it plays to Nick's horniness that he, like, that they had sex in the living room. Uh, you know, while Go is in the next room. Finally, someone calling him a fucking idiot. Yeah, I, I knew y'all would enjoy that, because I'm like, oh, this is the scene, Go is probably gonna call him a fucking idiot. <laughs> Did they bone? A question as old as time. <laughs> the only person who genuinely liked Nick was his sister. Yeah. And it's because Nick and Go are just... Uh... Go away. <laughs> having a Norton thing. Um, they're just like gender-bent versions of each other. <laughs> That's why they like each other. Amy Elliott Dunn, July 21st, 2011. Diary entry. I am such an idiot. That's great, because the last... Okay, so the last line, we go from Nick, you fucking idiot, to Amy saying, I am such an idiot. Sometimes I look at myself and I think, no wonder Nick finds me ridiculous, frivolous, spoiled, compared to his mom. Maureen is dying. She, finds her, she hides her disease behind big smiles and roomy embroidered sweatshirts, answering every question about her health with, Oh, I'm just fine, but how are you doing, sweetie? She is dying, but she is not going to admit it. Not yet. So yesterday she phones me in the morning, asks me if I want to go on a field trip with her and her friends. She is having a good day. She wants to get out of the house as much as she can. And I agree immediately, even though I knew they'd be doing nothing that particularly interested me. Uh, pinochle, bridge, some church activity that usually requires sorting things. We'll be there in 15 minutes, she says. Wear short sleeves. Cleaning. It had to be cleaning. Something requiring elbow grease. I throw on a short sleeve shirt, and in exactly 15 minutes, I am opening the door to Maureen, bald under a knitted cap, giggling with her two friends. They are all wearing matching appliqued t-shirts, all bells and ribbons with the words the, plas the plasmamas airbrushed across their chests. I wonder what that's a pun of. Plasma. Plasmamas. Okay, 
The plasmamas airbrushed onto their chests. I think they've started a doo-wop group, but then we all climb into Rose's old Chrysler. Old, old. One of those where the front seat goes all the way across. A grandmotherly car that smells of lady cigarettes. And off we merrily go to the Plasma Donation Center. We're Mondays and Thursdays, Rose explains, looking at me in the rear view. Oh, I say. How else does one reply? Oh, those are awesome plasma days. You're allowed to give twice a week, says Maureen, the bells on her sweatshirt jingling. The first time you get $20, the second time you get 30 That's why everyone's in such a good mood today. You'll love it, Vicky says. Everyone just sits and chats like a beauty salon. Maureen squeezes my arm and says quietly, I can't give any more, but I thought you could be my proxy. It might be a nice way for you to get some pin money. It's good for a girl to have a little cash of her own. I swallow a quick gust of anger. I used to have more than a little cash of my own, but I gave it to your son. A scrawny man in an undersized jean jacket hangs around the parking lot like a stray dog. Inside, though, the place is clean. Well lit, piney smelling, with Christian posters on the wall, all doves and mist. But I know I can't do it. Needles, blood, I, I can't do either. I don't really have any other phobias, but those two are solid. I am the girl who swoons at a paper cut. Something about the opening of skin, peeling, slicing, piercing, during chemo with Maureen. I never looked when they put in the needle. Hi, Kay- Ooh, what is this name? Kaylees? C-A-Y-L-E-E-S-E. -E -E. It's Kaleesi. <laughs> hey, hey Kaylees. I'm just going with it. Maureen calls out as we enter, and a heavy black woman in a vaguely medical uniform calls back. Oh, okay, that's why. I'm white in ignorance. Okay, Kaylees is probably a more common name than I have. I've just never heard it before, because I'm uncultured. Uh, so Kaylees... Calls back, uh, hi there, Maureen. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm fine, just fine, but how are you? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> they repeat that. Um, how long have you been doing this? I ask. A while, Maureen says. Kaylees is everyone's favorite. She gets the needle in real smooth, smooth, which was always good for me because I have rollers. She proffers her forearm with its ropey blue veins. Oh, interesting. I wonder what rollers are. It must be a type of vein or something. Oh, I see. Rollers. We'll get into it. Ooh. You get paid 30 on first donation, and this month you got 55? Hell yeah. <laughs> Y'all got paid for donations? My pan blood is out there somewhere, plotting. Damn. Yeah, don't tell them we're don't tell them we're into that we're not straight. They'll be like, your blood is bad. Shoo, shoo. Um, yeah, we explain with the next part what rollers are. Uh, she proffers her arm with its ropey blue veins. When I first met when I first oh, higher when I first met Mo, she was fat, but no more. It's odd; she actually looks better fat. See? Try, put, uh, try to put your finger on one. I look around, hoping Kaylees is going to usher us in. <laughs> Go on, try. I touch a fingertip to the vein and feel it roll out from under. A rush of heat overtakes me. So, okay. So this is our new recruit, Kaylees asks, suddenly beside me. Maureen br brags on you all the time. So we'll need you to fill out some paperwork. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. I, I can't do needles. I can't do blood. I have a serious phobia. I literally can't do it. I realize I haven't eaten today, and a wave of wooziness hits me. My neck feels weak. Everything here is very hygienic. You're in very good hands, Kaylee says. No, it's not that, truly. I've, I've never given blood. My doctor gets angry at me because I can't even handle a yearly blood test for, like, cholesterol. Instead, we wait. It takes two hours... Vicky and Rose strapped to churning machines, like they are being harvested. They've even been branded on their fingers, so they can't give more than twice in a week anywhere. 
the marks show up under a purple light. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, that's the James Bond part, Vicky says, and they all giggle. Maureen hums the Bond theme song, I think, and Rose makes a gun with her fingers. Can't you old biddies keep it down for once? Calls a white-haired woman four chairs down. She leans up over the reclined bodies of three oily men, green-blue tattoos on their arms, stubble on their chins, the kind of men I pictured donating plasma, and gives a finger wave with her loose arm. Mary, I thought you were coming tomorrow. <laughs> I was, but my unemployment doesn't come for a week, and I was down for a box of cereal and a can of creamed corn. <laughs> they all laugh like near starvation is amusing. This town is sometimes too much, so desperate and so in denial. I begin to feel ill, the sound of blood churning, the long plastic ribbons of blood coursing from bodies to machines, the people being, what, being farmed? Blood everywhere I look, out in the open, where blood isn't supposed to be, deep and dark, almost purple. I get up to go to the bathroom, throw cold water on my face. I take two steps and my ears close up, my vision pinholes, I feel my own heartbeat, my own blood, and as I fall I say, oh, sorry. That's exactly like me when I faint. That's great. Uh, for those who don't know, I have a fainting condition where I just kind of pass out sometimes. And when I do, I always apologize. Like, I don't have a lot of memory of the events, um, but someone will say, you just kept saying sorry over and over. <laughs> I barely remember the ride home. Maureen tucks me into, into a bed, into bed, a glass of apple juice, a bowl of soup at the bedside. We try to call Nick. Go says he's not at the bar and he doesn't pick up his cell. The man disappears. He was like that as a boy too. He's a wanderer, Maureen says. Worst thing you could ever do is ground him to his room. She positions a cool washcloth on my forehead. Her breath has the tangy smell of aspirin. Your job is to rest, okay? I'll keep calling till I get that boy home. When Nick gets home, I'm asleep. I wake up to him taking a shower, and I check the time, 11.04. He must have gone by the bar after all. He likes to shower after a shift, get the beer and salty popcorn smell off his skin, he says. He slips into bed, and when I turn to him with open eyes, he looks dismayed I'm awake. I've been trying to reach you for hours, I say. My phone was out of juice. You fainted? I thought you said your f phone was out of juice. He pauses, and I know he's about to lie. Oh, wait, sorry. He pauses, <laughs> and I know he's about to lie. The worst feeling, when you just have to wait and prepare yourself for the lie. Nick is old-fashioned. He needs his freedom. He doesn't like to explain himself. <clears throat> we'll know he has plans with the guys for a week, and he'll still wait until an hour before the poker game to tell me nonchalantly. Oh, to tell me nonchalantly, hey, so I thought I'd join the guys for poker tonight, if that's okay with you, and leave me to be the bad guy if I've made other plans. You, never, you don't ever want to be the wife who keeps her husband from playing poker. You don't want to be the shrew with the hair curlers and the rolling pin. So you swallow your disappointment and say, okay. I don't think he does this to be mean, it's just how he was raised. His dad did his own thing, always, and his mom put up with it. Until she divorced him. He begins his lie. I don't even listen. Yeah, yeah, timeline-wise, I think he was just, he was out with Andy. Nick done. Five days gone. I leaned against the door, staring at my sister. I could still smell Andy, and I wanted that moment to myself for one second, because now that she was gone, I could enjoy the idea of her. Isn't that... That's a great assessment of Nick's character, is he wants something when he can't have it. Uh, page 159. 158, actually. Writing that down. 
<sighs> More like get the adultery out of his skin. <laughs> She always tasted like butterscotch and smelled like lavender. Lavender shampoo, lavender lotion. Lavender's for luck, she explained to me once. I'd need luck. How old is she? Go is demanding, hands on hips. That's where you want to start. How old is she, Nick? 23. 23? Brilliant. Go, don't... Nick, do you not realize how fucked you are? Go said. Fucked and dumb. She made dumb. A kid's word hit me as hard as if I were a ten-year-old again. It's not an ideal situation. Oh, my voice quiet. It's not an ideal situation. I allowed my voice quiet. Ideal situation! You are... You're a cheater, Nick. I mean, what happened to you? You were always one of the good guys. Or have I just been an idiot all along? No. I stared at the floor at the same spot I stared at as a kid when my mom sat me down on the sofa and told me I was better than whatever I'd just done. Now, you're a man who cheats on his wife. You can't ever undo that, Go said. God, even Dad didn't cheat. You're so... I mean, your wife is missing. Amy, who knows... who knows where? And you're here, making time with a little... Go, I enjoy this revisionist history in which you're Amy's champion. I mean, you never liked Amy, not even early on. And since all this happened, it's like... It's like I have sympathy for your missing wife? Yeah, Nick, I have concern. Yeah, I do. Remember remember how before when I said you were being weird? You're... It's insane the way you're acting. She paced the room, chewing a thumbnail. The police find out about this, and I just don't even know, she said. I'm fucking scared, Nick. This is the first time I'm really scared for you. I, I can't believe they haven't found out yet. They must have pulled your phone records. I used a disposable. She paused at that. That's even worse. That's like premeditation. Premeditated cheating. Go. Yes, I am guilty of that. She's, she succumbed for a second, collapsed on the sofa the new reality settling on her. In truth, I was relieved that Go knew. How long? she asked. A little over a year. I made myself pull my eyes from the floor and look at her directly. Over a year? And you never told me? I was afraid you'd tell me to stop, that you'd think badly of me, and then I'd have to stop, and I didn't want to. Things with Amy- Over a year, Go said. And I never even guessed- Eight thousand drug conversations, and you, you never trusted me enough to tell me. I didn't know you could do that. Keep something from me that totally. That's the only thing. Go shrugged. How can I believe you now? That's what goes. That's what he's saying that Go is thinking. You love her? She, oh. <laughs> you love her? She gave it a jokey spin to show how unlikely it was. Yeah, I really think I do. I, I did. I do. You do realize that if you actually dated her, saw her on a regular basis, lived with her, that she would find some faults with you, right? That she would find some things about you that drove her crazy? That she'd make demands of you that you didn't like? That she'd get angry at you? I'm not ten. Go, I know how relationships work. She shrugged again. As if to say, do you? Do, do you? We need a lawyer, she said. A good lawyer with some PR skills, because the networks, some cable shows, they're sniffing around. We need to make sure the media doesn't turn you into the evil, philandering husband, because if that happens, I just think it's all over. Go, you're sounding a little drastic. I actually agreed with her, but I couldn't bear to hear the words aloud from Go. I had to discredit them. Nick, this is a little drastic. I'm going to make some calls. Whatever you want, if it makes you feel better. Go jabbed me in the sternum with two hard fingers. Don't you fucking pull that with me, Lance. Oh, girls get so overexcited. That's bullshit. You are in a really bad place, my friend. Get your head out of your ass and start helping me fix this. Beneath my shirt, I could feel the spot embering on my skin as Go turned away from me and, thank God, went back to her room. I sat on her couch, numb. Then I lay down as I promised myself I'd get up. Yeah, you know you're in trouble when go is like, what the fuck? Um, yeah, I'm writing that down, because like, holy shit. 
Go is not... She's angry in... Um, Go getting the grade. She's angry in the movie. But in the book, she's actually getting into like... Hey... Uh, what did she say? Something struck me about what she talked about. Oh, this 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 paragraph where she says, uh, "You do realize that if you actually dated her, saw her on a regular basis, lived with her, that she would find some fault with you, right? That she would find some things about you that drove her crazy. That she'd make demands of you that you wouldn't like. That she'd get angry at you. So, even she is being realistic about like." Hey, you just like Amy because you just want something different and you want something easy. But if you are actually dating, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know it's bad when Go, who's supposed to be a clone of you, is saying shit like that. <sighs> that's, that's very interesting. Because I was saying before I liked movie Go better, but... That's dope. I, li I, I like that she's talking about that. I dreamed of Amy. She was crawling across our kitchen floor, hands on knees, trying to make it to the back door, but she was blind from the blood, and she was moving so slowly, too slowly. Her pretty head was strangely misshapen, dead to it on the right side. Blood was dripping from one long hank of hair, and she was moaning my name. I woke and knew it was time to go home. I needed to see the place, the scene of the crime. I needed to face it. Ooh. I'm writing that down too because, um, let's see the, the shape of her head. Uh, the shape of her head is the first bit that we get in the novel. Uh, if we go back to, this is the very first chapter of the book. The day of. When I think of my wife, I always think of her head. The shape of it, to begin with. The very first time I saw her, it was the back of the head I saw. And there was something lovely about it. The angles of it. Like a shiny, hard corn kernel or a riverbed fossil. She had what the Victorians would call a finely shaped head. You could imagine the skull quite easily. I know her head anywhere. And then he starts talking about like what's inside it. Her brain. But then he starts talking about like unspooling it and like dissecting it and stuff which is very interesting because he talks so much about her head and yet he doesn't give a shit about what's inside of it he talks about i like to think of what's inside it but you don't actually give a shit about amy you just like what amy represents <clears throat> no one was out in the heat our neighborhood was as vacant and lonely as the day amy disappeared I stepped inside my front door and made myself breathe. Weird that a house so new could feel haunted, and not in the romantic Victorian novel way, just really gruesomely, shittily ruined. A house with a history, and it was only three years old. The lab technicians had been all over the place. Surfaces were smeared and sticky and smudged. I sat down on the sofa, and it smelled like someone, like an actual person, with a stranger scent, a spicy aftershave. I know spicy is supposed to be like spices, but I, I'm like picturing like hot spicy. I opened the windows despite the heat, getting some air. Bleaker trotted down the stairs, and I picked him up and petted him while he purred. Someone, some cop, had overfilled his bowl for me. A nice gesture after dismantling my home. I set him down carefully on the bottom step, then climbed up to the bedroom, unbuttoning my shirt. I lay down across the bed and put my face in the pillow, the same navy blue pillowcase I'd stared into the morning of our anniversary. The morning of. That's cool. The morning of is capitalized, like, uh, like it was, you know, like, at the beginning of each chapter you get Nick Dunn, the day of, Nick Dunn, the morning of. My phone rang. Go. I picked up. Ellen Abbott is doing a special noonday show. It's about Amy. You. I, uh, it doesn't look good. You want me to come over? No, I, I can watch it alone. Thanks. We both hovered on the line. 
waiting for the other to apologize. Okay, let's talk after, Go said. That's how they handle things. Because <laughs> we've talked about how Nick just doesn't apologize. Ellen Abbott Live was a cable show specializing in missing murdered women, starring the permanently furious Ellen Abbott, a former prosecutor and victim's rights advocate. The show opened with Ellen, blow-dried and lip-glossed, glaring at the camera. A shocking story to report today. A beautiful young woman who was the inspiration for the, aiming, a, a, <laughs> for the Amazing Amy book series. Missing. House torn apart. Hubby is Lance Nicholas Dunn, an unemployed writer who now owns a bar he bought with his wife's money. Wanna know how... Wanna know, uh... Sorry, I've been butchering this. Let me start this paragraph over, because I want, I want to capture, like, Ellen Abbott. Um, a shocking story to report today. A beautiful young woman who was the inspiration for the Amazing Amy book series. Missing. House torn apart. Hubby is Lance Nicholas Dunn, an unemployed writer who now owns a bar he bought with his wife's money. Want to know how worried he is? These are photos taken since his wife, Amy Elliott Dunn, went missing July 5th, their five-year anniversary. Cut to the photo of me at the press conference, the jackass grin. Another of me waving and smiling like a pageant queen as I got out of my car. I was waving back to Mary Beth. I was smiling because I smile when I wave. Then up came the cell phone photo of me and Shauna Kelly, Frito Pie Baker. The two of us cheek to cheek, beaming pearly whites. Then the real Shauna appeared on screen, tanned and sculpted and somber as Ellen introduced her to America. Pinpr pinpricks of sweat erupted all over me. I'm trying to figure out if she's like speaking this out loud. I don't think they're speaking. I think they're speaking out loud. Yeah, his name is Lance. They said that earlier. Uh, his name is Lance, and he was like, that's worse. You know, he was like, everyone hates me, and you especially hate someone named Lance. So he goes by his middle name. Oh, God. Okay, so Ellen. I'm trying to figure out if they're, like, talking out loud or if this is a text conversation. Uh, I think it's out loud. They just doing they're doing it in a weird way because they say Ellen in all caps and then colon and then what they say. So I'm just gonna read it like that. Ellen. So Lance Nicholas Dutton. Can you describe his demeanor for us, Shauna? You meet him you meet him as everyone is out searching for his missing wife, and Lance Nicholas Dunn is what? Shauna. He was very calm, very friendly. Oh, he was very calm, very friendly. She had like a little southern. Ellen. Oh, wait, was Shauna... I think she was... Yeah, she was Southern. She gave a little, I gave her a little Southern thing. Ellen. Excuse me, excuse me. He was friendly and calm. His wife is missing Shauna. What kind of man is friendly and calm? The grotesque photo appeared on screen again. We somehow looked even more cheerful. Shauna. He was actually a little flirty. You should have been nicer to her, Nick. You should have eaten the fuck- Oh, oh, this is Nick thinking. You should have been nicer to her, Nick. You should have eaten the fucking pie. Yeah, because I remember now. I was like, why was she, like, was he not nice? But I remember the last interaction they had was him being cold with her. Ellen. Flirty? While his wife is God knows where, and Lance Dunn is- well, I'm sorry, Shauna, but this photo is just, I don't know, a better word than disgusting. This is not how an innocent man looks. The rest of the segment was basically Ellen Abbott, a professional hate monger, obsessing over my lack of alibi. Why doesn't Lance Nicholas Dunn have an alibi until noon? Where was he that morning? She drawled in her Texas sheriff's accent. I wish you'd said that earlier. I would have given her an accent. 
I guess I'll give her an accent now. Her panel of guests agreed that it didn't look good. I phoned Go, and she said, Well, you made it almost a week without them turning on you. And we cursed for a while. Fucking Shauna crazy bitch whore. Do something really, really useful today. Active, Go advised. People will be watching now. I couldn't sit still if I wanted to. I drove to St. Louis in a near rage, replaying the TV segment in my head, answering all of Ellen's questions, shutting her up. To di- oh. <laughs> Alright, Nick's about to get very mean. Today, Ellen Abbott, you fucking cunt, I tracked down one of Amy's stalkers, Desi Collings. I tracked him down to get the truth. Me, the hero husband. If I had soaring theme music, I would have played it. Me, the nice working class guy, taking on the spoiled rich kid. The media would have to bite at that. Obsessive stalkers are more intriguing than run-of-the-mill wife killers. The Elliots, at least, would appreciate it. I dialed Mary Beth, but just got voicemail. Onward. As I rolled into his neighborhood, I had to change my Desi vision from rich to extremely sickly wealthy. The guy lived in a mansion in Ladd that... Oh, I don't know how to pronounce that. L-A-D-U-E? Ladd? We'll pronounce it Ladd. The guy lived in a mansion in Ladd that probably cost at least $5 million. Whitewashed brick, black lacquer shutters, gas light, and ivy. I'd dressed for the meeting, a decent suit and tie, but I realized as I rang his doorbell that a $400 suit in this neighborhood was more poignant than if I'd showed up in jeans. I could hear a clattering of dress shoes coming from the back of the house to the front, and the door opened with a desuctioning sound, like a refrigerator. Cold air rolled out toward me. Desi looked the way I had always wanted to look, like a very handsome, very decent fellow. Something in the eyes, or the jaw. He had deep-set almond eyes, teddy bear eyes, and dimples in both cheeks. If you saw the two of us together, you'd assume he was the good guy. Oh. Hmm. I'm trying to figure out what voice I want to give Desi. Do I want to... I'll just give him kind of a... Kind of a voice up here. Because it's Neil Patrick Harris. <laughs> At least in the movie. Oh. Desi said, studying my face. You're Nick. Nick Dunn. Good God, I'm, I'm so sorry about Amy. Come in, come in. He ushered me into a severe living room. Manliness as envisioned by a decorator. Lots of dark, uncomfortable leather. He pointed me toward an armchair with a particularly rigid back. I tried to make myself comfortable, as urged, but found the only posture the chair allowed was that of a chastised student. Pay attention and sit up. Desi didn't ask me why I was in his living room, or explain how he'd immediately recognized me. Although they were becoming more common, the double takes and cupped whispers. May I get you a drink? Desi asked, pressing two hands together. Business first. I'm fine. He sat down opposite me. He was dressed in, in impeccable shades of navy and cream. Even his shoelaces looked pressed. He carried it all off, though. He wasn't the dismissible fop I had been hoping for. Desi seemed the definition of a gentleman. A guy who could quote a great poet, order a rare scotch, and buy a woman the right piece of vintage jewelry. He seemed, in fact a man who knew inherently what women wanted. Across from him, I felt my suit wilt, my manner go clumsy. I had a swelling urge to discuss football and fart. These were the kind of guys who always got to me. Well, that's a, that's a very good description of um, Neil Patrick Harris. 163, I'm gonna write that down. This has been great for my video. Uh, Desi description. Yeah, because it's a novel, you get, uh, and, and because of the way Gillian Flynn writes, you get this, these very good descriptions of the character that, like, as an actor, I'm like, this is what was on the acting sides, you know? Description of Desi. And that's why I love her as a, as a, a writer. You can just pull out these paragraphs and be like, this perfectly describes the character. 
before you get into them actually like being a character. Why did Amy and Desi break up again? Uh, they were in boarding school and Desi was like super obsessive and um, they had, I remember, I'm trying to distinguish book Desi from movie Desi and I'm trying to remember because in the movie um, they didn't talk about exactly how Desi had tried to kill himself or something, but he had, um, uh, I think they had broken up and Amy came back to find Desi naked in her room and he was sprawled out on the bed and had just tried to overdose on pills. Uh, so I think he was just troubled as a kid. Let's see. Uh, Amy, any leads? Desi asked. He looked like someone familiar. An actor, maybe. <laughs> no good ones. She was taken from the home, is that correct? From our home, yes. <clears throat> Pardon me. Burped. Then I knew who he was. Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> then I knew who he was. He was the guy who'd shown up at... He's the, he, the guy... Uh, in the movie, this is more clear, and I wasn't sure if they had put it in or not. But uh, let's see. Then I knew who he was. He was the guy who'd shown up alone the first day of searches. The guy who kept sneaking looks at Amy's photo. You were at the volunteer center, weren't you? The first day. I was, Desi said, reasonable. I was about to say that. I wish I'd been able to meet you that day, express my condolences. Long way to come. I could say the same to you. He smiled. Look, I'm really fond of Amy. Hearing what had happened, well, I had to do something. I just... It's terrible to say this, Nick, but when I, when I saw it on the news, I just thought, of course. Of course? Of course, someone would want her, he said. He had a deep voice, a fireside voice. You know, she always had that way of making people want her. Always. You know that old cliche, men want her and women want to be her? With Amy, that was true. Yeah, so if I hadn't given Nick this voice, I'd probably give Desi this voice. But uh, we're going Neil Patrick. Desi folded large hands across his trousers. Not pants. Trousers. I couldn't decide if he was fucking with me. I told myself to tread lightly. It's the rule of all potentially prickly interviews. Don't go on the offense until you have to. First see if they'll hang themselves all on their own. You had a very intense relationship with Amy, right? I asked. It wasn't only her looks, Desi said. He leaned on a knee, his eyes distant. I've thought about this a lot, of course. First love. I've definitely thought about it. The navel gazer in me. Too much philosophy. He cracked a self, uh, he cracked a self-effacing grin. The dimples popped. See, when Amy likes you, when she's interested in you, her attention is so warm and reassuring and entirely enveloping, like a warm bath. I raised my eyebrows. Bear with me, he said. You feel good about yourself, completely good, for maybe the first time. And then she sees your flaws. She realizes you're just another regular person she has to deal with. You are, in actuality, Abel Andy. And in real life, Abel Andy would never make it with amazing Amy. So her interest fades, and you stop feeling good. You can feel that old coldness again, like you're naked on the bathroom floor, and all you want is to get back in the bath. I knew that feeling. I'd been on the bathroom floor for about three years, and I felt a rush of disgust for sharing this emotion with this other man. I'm sure you know what I mean, Desi said, and smiled winkily at me. What an odd man, I thought. Who compares another man's wife to a bath he wants to sink into? Another man's missing wife. Behind Desi was a long, polished end table bearing several silver-framed photos. In the center was an oversized one of Desi and Amy back in high school, in tennis whites. The two so preposterously stylish, so moneyed lush, they could have been a frame from a Hitchcock movie. I pictured Desi, teenage Desi, slipping into Amy's dorm room, dropping his clothes to the floor, 
settling onto the cold sheets, swallowing plastic-coated pills, waiting to be found. It was a form of punishment, of rage, but not the kind that occurred in my house. I could see why the police weren't that interested. Desi trailed my glance. Uh, let me see. Oh, that's Desi talking. <clears throat> oh, well, you can't blame me for that, he smiled. I mean, would you throw away a picture that perfect? Of a girl I hadn't known for 20 years, I said before I could stop. I realized my tone sounded more aggressive than wise. Oh, so it was probably more like, of a girl I hadn't known for 20 years? I know Amy, Desi snapped. He took a breath. I knew her. I knew her very well. There aren't any leads? I have to ask. Her father, is he... There. Of course he is. I don't suppose... He was definitely in New York when it happened. He was in New York. He was in New York. Why? Desi shrugged. Just curious, no reason. That's in italics, like he's thinking. That's what he's thinking. We sat in silence for a half minute, playing a game of eye contact chicken. Neither of us blinked. I actually came here, Desi, to see what you could tell me. I tried again to picture Desi making off with Amy. Did he have a lake house somewhere nearby? All these types did. Would it be believable, this refined, sophisticated man keeping Amy in some preppy basement rec room? Amy pacing the carpet, sleeping on a dusty sofa in some bright, clubby 60s color, lemon yellow or coral. I wished Boney and Gilpin were here, had witnessed the prop proprietary tone of Desi's voice, I know Amy. Me? Desi laughed. He la Desi laughed. He laughed richly. <laughs> he laughed richly. It's very good. The perfect phrase to describe the sound. I can't tell you anything. Like you said, I don't know her. But you just said you did. I certainly don't know her like you know her. You stalked her in high school. I stalked her? Nick, she was my girlfriend. Until she wasn't, I said and you wouldn't go away. Oh, I probably did pine for her, but nothing out of the ordinary. You call trying to kill yourself in her dorm room ordinary? He jerked his head, squinted his eyes. He opened his mouth to speak, then stared down at his hands. I'm not sure what you're talking about, Nick, he finally said. I'm talking about you stalking my wife in high school. Now. That's really... What this is about? He laughed again. Good God, I thought you were raising money for a reward fund or something. Which I'm happy to cover, by the way. Like I said, I've never stopped wanting the best for Amy. Do I love her? No. I don't know her anymore, not really. We exchange the occasional letter. But it is interesting, you coming here. You confusing the issue. Because I have to tell you, Nick, on TV, hell... Here, now, you don't seem to be a grieving, worried husband. You seem smug. The police, by the way, already talked with me, thanks, I guess, to you. Or Amy's parents. Strange you didn't know. You'd think they'd tell the husband everything if he were in the clear. My, hu <laughs> my stomach clenched. I'm here because I wanted to see for myself your face when you talked about Amy, I said. I gotta tell you, it worries me. You get a little... moony. One of us has to, Desi said, again, reasonably. Sweetheart, a voice came from the back of the house. Another set of expensive shoes clattered toward the living room. Oh, well, what was the name of that book? The woman was a blurry vision of... Uh, the woman was a blurry vision of Amy. Amy in a steam-fogged mirror... Exact coloring, extremely similar features, but a quarter century older. The flesh, the features, all let out a bit like a fine fabric. She was still gorgeous, a woman who chose to age gracefully. She was shaped like some sort of origami creation. Elbows in extreme points, a clothes hanger collarbone. She wore a china blue sheath dress and had the same pull Amy did. When she was in a room, you kept turning your head back her way. She gave me a rather predatory smile. Hello, I'm Jacqueline Collings. 
Oh, okay, this is... <laughs> Mother, this is Amy's husband, Nick, Desi said. Amy, the woman smiled again. She had a bottom of a well voice, deep and strangely resonant. We've been quite interested in that story around here. Yes, very interested. She turned, cordly, she turned coldly toward her son. We can never stop thinking about the superb Amy Elliot, can we? Amy Dunn now, I said. Of course, Jacqueline agreed. I'm so sorry, Nick, for, for what you're going through. She stared at me a moment. I'm sorry, I must... I didn't picture Amy with such an American boy. She seemed to be speaking neither to me nor to Desi. Good God, he even has a cleft chin. I came over to see if your son had any information, I said. I know he's written my wife a lot of letters over the years. Oh, the letters! Jacqueline smiled angrily. <laughs> Such an interesting way to spend one's time, don't you think? Amy shared them with you, Desi asked. I'm surprised. No, I said, turning to him. She threw them away unopened, always. All of them? Always. You know that? Desi said, still smiling. Once I went through the trash to read one, I turned back to Jacqueline, just to see what exactly was going on. Good for you, Jacqueline said, purring at me. I'd expect nothing less of my husband. Amy and I always wrote each other letters, Desi said. He had his mother's cadence, the delivery that indicated everything he said was something you'd want to hear. It was our thing. I find email so cheap, and no one saves them. No one saves an email, because it's so inherently impersonal. I worry about posterity in general. All the great love letters, from Simone de Beauvoir to Satter, from Samuel Clemens to his wife, Olivia. I don't know, I always think about what will be lost. Have you kept all my letters? Jacqueline asked. <laughs> she was standing at the fireplace, looking down on us. One long, sinewy arm trailing along the mantelpiece. Of course. She turned to me with an elegant shrug. Just curious. I shivered. Was about to reach out towards the fireplace for warmth, but remembered it was July. It seems to me a rather strange devotion to keep up all these years, I said. I mean, she didn't write you back. That lit up Desi's eyes. Oh, was all he said. The sound of someone who spied a surprise firework. It strikes me as odd, Nick, that you'd come here and ask Desi about his relationship, or lack thereof, with your wife, Jacqueline Collins said. Are you and Amy not close? I can guarantee you, Desi has had no genuine contact with Amy in decades. Decades. I'm just checking in, Jacqueline. Uh, sometimes you have to see something for yourself. Jacqueline started walking toward the door. She turned and gave me a single twist of her head to assure me that it was time to go. How very intrepid of you, Nick. Very do-it-yourself. Do you build your own decks, too? She laughed at the word and opened the door for me. I stared at the hollow of her neck and wondered why she wasn't wearing a noose of pearls. Women like this always have thick strands of pearls to click and clack. I could smell her, though, a female scent, vaginal and strangely lewd. It was interesting meeting... It was interesting to meet you, Nick, she said. Let's all hope Amy gets home safely. Until then, the next time you want to get in touch with Desi... She, plus, she pressed a thick, creamy card into my hands. Call our lawyer, please. Ooh, that is interesting. That is... Oof. Uh, Desi's mom is not in the movie, so that was very interesting for me, where I was like, who is this? Is this a girlfriend? Because Desi is single in the movie. Um, and then he just called her mother, which is the most Neil Patrick Harris thing you can do, is just to call someone mother. It's a, it's a, I, I, I know, I, I can see why they wanted to cast Neil in that role. Neil is, um, especially in the movie, he gives Desi the, um, the perfect amount of creepy while also sophisticated and rich, you know. Neil, um, I 
calling him Neil like I know him or something. Um, I really like him as a casting choice for Desi, despite not having a deeper voice. I I think it's perfect casting. I was about to say he didn't mention her tits. Then came vaginal and lewd. Yep. Yeah. I was I was um I was thinking the same thing. Honestly, I was like, wow. A female character where he doesn't mention that. I'm gonna... You know what? I gotta write that down. Vaginal and strangely lewd is such a... <laughs> Not straggly, you silly piece of shit. Strangely. Dude, that's a word. It's a word. Strangely is a word. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amy Elliott Dunn, August 17th, 2011. Oh, also, before I continue with Amy's chapter, uh, that's a really interesting scene because in the movie, Desi doesn't let him in the house. Desi opens the door and is very creepy and it's just kind of like like, just looks at him like this, and, and, and is like, yes, hello, mm, cool, great, well, goodbye, and shuts the door on him and doesn't let him inside. So this is a whole scene that was just cut. I guess because if you let him in the house, you also have to do everything with the mom. Amy Elliott Dunn, August 17th, 2011. Diary entry. I know this sounds the stuff of moony teenage girls, but I've been tracking Nick's moods toward me, just to make sure I'm not crazy. I've got a calendar, and I put hearts on any day Nick seems to love me again, and black squares where he doesn't. The past year was all black squares, pretty much. But now, nine days of hearts. In a row. Maybe all he needed to know was how much I loved him and how unhappy I'd become. Maybe he had a change of heart. I've never loved a phrase more. Quiz. After a, over a year of... Qu quiz. After over a year of coldness, your husband suddenly seems to love you again. You, A, go on and on about how much he's hurt you so he can apologize some more. B, give him the cold shoulder for a while longer so he learns his lesson. C, don't press him about his new attitude. Know that he will confide in you when the time comes, and in the meantime, shower him with affection so he feels secure and loved because that's how this marriage thing works. D. Demand to know what went wrong. Make him talk, and talk about it in order to calm your own neurosis. Answer. C. It's August. So sumptuous that I couldn't bear any more black squares. But no, it's been nothing but hearts. Nick acting like my husband, sweet and loving and goofy. He orders me chocolates from my favorite shop in New York for a treat, and he writes me a silly poem to go with them. A limerick, actually. There, there once was a girl from Manhattan who slept only on sheets made of satin. Her husband slipped and he slided, and their bodies collided, so they did something dirty in Latin. It would be funnier if our sex life was as carefree as the rhyme would suggest. But last week we did... Fuck? Do it? Something more romantic than have sex, but less cheesy than make love. He came home from work and kissed me full on the lips, and he touched me as if I were really there. I almost cried, I'd been so lonely. To be kissed on the lips by your husband is the most decadent thing. What else? He takes me swimming in the same pond he's gone to since he was a child. I can picture little Nick flapping around... Uh... I could picture little Nick flapping around manically, face and shoulders sunburned red, because, just like now, he refuses to wear sunscreen, forcing Mama Moe to chase after him with lotion that she swipes on whenever she can reach him. He's been taking me on a full tour of his boyhood haunts like I asked him to for ages. He walks me to the edge of the river, and he kisses me as the wind whips my hair. My two favorite things to look, my two favorite things to look at in the world, he whispers in my ear. He kisses me in a funny little playground fort that he once considered his own clubhouse. I always wanted to bring a girl here, a perfect girl, and look at me now, he whispers in my ear. 
two days before the mall closes for good, we ride carousel bunnies side by side, our laughter, our laughter echoing through the empty miles. He takes me for a Sunday at his favorite ice cream parlor, and we have the place to ourselves in the morning, the air all sticky with sweets. He kisses me and says this place is where he stuttered and suffered through so many dates, and he wishes he could have told his high school self that he would be back here with the girl of his dreams someday. We'd e we eat ice cream until we have to roll home and get under the covers. His hand on my belly, an accidental nap. The neurotic in me, of course, is asking, where's the catch? Nick's turnaround is so sudden and so grandiose. It feels like, it feels like he must want something, or he's already done something, and he's being preemptively sweet for when I find out. I worry. I caught him last week shuffling through my thick file box marked The Duns, written in my best cursive in, ha in happier days. A box filled with all the strange paperwork that makes up a marriage, a combined life. I worry that he's going to ask me for a second mortgage on the bar, or to borrow against our life insurance, or to sell off some not-to-be-touched-for-thirty-years stock. He said he just wanted to make sure everything was in order, but he said it in a fluster. My heart would break, it, it really would, if mid-bites of bubblegum ice cream he turned to me and said, You know, the interesting thing about a second mortgage is... I hate to write that, I, I had to let that out. And just seeing it, I know it sounds crazy. Neurotic and insecure and suspicious. I will not let my worst self ruin my marriage. My husband loves me. He loves me and he has come back to me. And that is why he's treating me so nice. That is the only reason. Just like that, here is my life. It's finally returned. Mm. Nick Dunn, five days gone. I sat in the billowing heat of my car outside Desi's house. The windows rolled down and checked my phone. A message from Gilpin. Hi, Nick. We need to touch base today. Update you on a few things. Go over a few questions. Meet us at four at your house, okay? Uh, thanks. It was the first time I'd been ordered. Not, could we? We'd love to, if you don't mind. But, we need to meet. Meet us, dot, dot, dot. I glanced at my watch. Three o'clock. Best not be late. Did he say a time? We need to touch base. Update you. Oh, meet us at four. Okay, Gilpin said four. The summer air show, a parade of jets and prop planes spinning loops up and down the Mississippi, buzzing the tourist steamboats, rattling teeth, was three days off, and the practice runs were in high school. Er, sorry. And the practice runs were in high gear by the time Gilpin and Rhonda arrived. We were all back in my living room for the first time since the day of. My home was right on a flight path. The noise was somewhere between Jackhammer and Avalanche. My cop buddies and I tried to jam a conversation in the spaces between the blasts. Rhonda looked more bird-like than usual, favoring one leg, then another, her head moving all around the room as her gaze alighted on different objects, angles, a magpie looking to line her nest. Gilpin hovered next to her, chewing his lip, tapping a foot. Even the room felt restive. The afternoon sun lit up an atomic flurry of dust motes. A jet shot over the house, that awful sky-rip noise. Okay, couple of things here, Rhonda said when the silence returned. She and Gilpin sat down as if they both had suddenly decided to stay a while. Some stuff to get clear on, some stuff to tell you, all very routine, and as always, if you want a lawyer. But I knew from my TV shows, my movies, that only guilty guys lawyered up. Real, grieving, worried, innocent husbands did not. I don't, thanks, I said. I actually have some information to share with you, uh, about Amy's former stalker, the guy she dated back in high school. Desi, uh, Collins, began Gilpin. Collins, I know you all talked to him. I know you, for some reason, aren't that interested in him, so I went to visit him myself today, to make sure he seemed okay. And I don't think he's okay. I think he's someone you all should look into, really look into. I mean, he moved to St. Louis. He was living in... Uh, he was living in St. Louis three years before y'all moved back, Gilpin said. Fine, but he's in St. Louis. Early, easy drive. 
Amy bought a gun because she was afraid. Dizzy's... Dizzy's okay, Nick. Nice guy, Rhonda said. Don't you think? He reminds me of you, actually. Real golden boy, baby of the family. I'm a twin, not the baby. I'm actually three minutes older. Rhonda was clearly trying to nip at me, see if she could get a rise, but even knowing this didn't prevent the angry blood flush to my stomach every time she accused me of being a baby. Yeah, he can't. He can't handle that shit. I'm, ri I'm writing that down. 173. And this is neat for y'all to see my writing process. <laughs> Always get a lawyer, guys. Never talk to cops without a lawyer. For sure. Yes, I agree. Boop, 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 boop. Anyway, er, uh, it's Gilpin. <laughs> anyway, Gilpin interrupted. Both he and his mother deny that he ever stalked Amy, or that he even had much contact with her these past years, except the occasional note. My wife would tell you differently. He wrote Amy for years. Years. And then he shows up here for the search, Rhonda. Did you know that? He was here that first day. You talked about keeping an eye out for men inserting themselves into the investigation. Daisy Collins is not a suspect. She interrupted, one hand up. But... Daisy Collins is not a suspect, she repeated. The news stung. I wanted to accuse her of being swayed by Ellen Abbott, but Ellen Abbott was probably best left unmentioned. Okay, well, what about all these, these guys who clogged up our tip line? I walked over and grabbed the sheet of names and numbers that I had carelessly tossed on the dining room table. I began reading names. Inserting themselves into the investigation. David Sampson, Murphy Clark. Those are old boyfriends. Tommy O'Hara. Tommy O'Hara. Tommy O'Hara. That's three calls. Tito Puente. That's just a dumb joke. Well, that's interesting, I wonder. Tito Puente? Does that mean something in Spanish? <laughs> uh, have you phoned any of them back? Moni asked. No. Isn't that your job? I don't know which are worthwhile and which are crazies. I don't have time to call some jackass pretending to be Tito Puente. I wouldn't put too much emphasis on that tip line, Nick, Rhonda said. It's kind of a woodwork situation. I mean, we fielded a lot of phone calls from your old girlfriends. Just want to say hi. See how you are. People are strange. Maybe we should get started on our questions, Gilpin nudged. Right. Well, I guess we should begin with where you were the morning your wife went missing, Boney said, suddenly apologetic, deferential. She was playing good cop, and we both knew she was playing good cop. Unless she was actually on my side. It seemed possible that sometimes a cop was just on your side, right? <laughs> oh, Nick. No. <laughs> when I was at the beach? And you still can't recall anyone seeing you there? Boney asked. It'd help us so much if we could just cross this little thing off our list. She allowed a sympathetic silence. Rhonda could not only keep quiet. Rhonda could not only keep quiet, she could infuse the room with a mood of her choosing, like an octopus in its ink. Believe me, I'd like that as much as you. But no, I don't remember anyone. Boney smiled a worried smile. It's strange, we've mentioned, just in passing, you're being at the beach to a few people, and they all said, they were all surprised, let's put it that way, said they didn't sound like you, you aren't a beach guy. I shrugged. I mean, do I go to the beach and lay out all day? No, but to sip my coffee in the morning? Sure. Hey, this might help, Boney said brightly. Where'd you buy your coffee that morning? She turned to Gilpin as if to seek approval. Could tighten up the tide for the uh, could tighten up the time frame at least, right? I made it here, I said. Oh, she frowned. That's weird because you don't have any coffee here, nowhere in the house. I remember thinking it was odd. A caffeine addict notices these things. Right, just something you happen to notice. I thought. I knew a cop named Boney Maroney. 
Her traps are so obvious they're clearly phony. I had a leftover cup in the fridge I heated up. I shrugged again. No big deal. Huh. Must have been there a long time. I noticed there's no coffee container in the trash. A few days. Still tastes good. We both smiled at each other. I know and you know. Game on. I actually thought those idiotic words, game on. Yet I was pleased in a way. The next part was starting. Boney turned to Gilpin, hands on knees, and gave a little nod. Gilpin chewed his lip some more, then finally pointed. Toward the ottoman, the end table, the living room now, righted. See, here's our problem, Nick, he started. We've seen dozens of home invasions. Dozens upon dozens upon dozens, Boney interrupted. Many home invasions. This, all this area right there in the living room, remember it? The upturned ottoman, the overturned table, the vase on the floor. He slapped down a photo of the scene in front of me. This whole area, it was supposed to look like a struggle, right? My head expanded and snapped back into place. Stay calm. Supposed to? It looked wrong, Gilpin continued. From the second we saw it, to be honest, the whole thing looked staged. First of all, there's the fact that it was all centered in this one spot. Why wasn't anything messed up anywhere but this room? It, it's odd. He proffered another... Oh, sorry, that's Gilpin. I'm sorry, in the, uh, in the movie, this exact dialogue is Boney's, so I just went in a Boney's voice. It looked wrong, Gilpin continued. From the second we saw it, to be honest, the whole thing looked staged. First of all, there's the fact that it was all centered in this one spot. Why wasn't anything messed up anywhere but this room? It's odd. He proffered another photo, a close-up. And, and look here, at this pile of books, they should be right... They should be in front of this end table. The end table is where they were stacked, right? I nodded. So when the end table was knocked over, they should have spilled mostly in front of it, following the trajectory of the falling table. Instead, they're back behind it, as if someone swept them off before knocking over the table. I stared dumbly at the photo. Watch this. This is very curious to me, Gilpin continued. He pointed at three slender antique frames on the mantelpiece. On the mantelpiece. He stomped heavily, and they all flopped face down immediately. But somehow they stayed upright through everything else? Yeah, that's cool. All of this is bony in the movie. So it's really it's interesting that they um they they replaced a lot of Gilpin stuff with bonies. Uh Nick going to find the first clue. This dialogue, it's all bony in the movie. He showed a photo of the frames upright. I had been hoping, even after they caught my Houston's dinner slip-up, that they were dumb cops, cops from the movies, local rubes aiming to please, trusting the local guy. Whatever you say, buddy. I didn't get dumb cops. I don't know what you want me to say. I mumbled. Oh, hell yeah! Egglag! Egglag, thank you so much for the, for the bits. That's awesome, bud. Hell yeah. Really appreciate it. And we got we got some finally in the in the cup. Boop, 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 boop. Um Oh it was Nick's dialogue, let's see. I don't, I don't I don't know what you want me to say. I mumbled. It's totally I just don't know what to think about this. I I just want to find my wife. So do we, Nick. So do we, Rhonda said. But here's another thing. The ottoman. Remember how it was flipped upside down? She patted the squatty ottoman, pointed at its four peg legs, each only an inch high. See, this thing is bottom heavy because of those tiny legs. The cushion practically sits on the floor. Try to push it over. I hesitated. Go on, try it, Boney urged. I gave it a push, but it slid across the carpet instead of turning over. I nodded. I agreed. It was bottom heavy. Seriously, get down there if you need to and knock that thing upside down, Boney ordered. I knelt down, pushed from lower and lower angles, finally put a hand underneath the ottoman and flipped it. Even then it flipped it up, one side hovering, and fell back into place. I finally had to pick it up and turn it over manually. Weird, huh? 
Boney said, not sounding all that puzzled. Nick, do you, uh, you do any house cleaning the day your wife went missing? Gilpin asked. No. Okay, because the tech did a luminol sweep, and I'm sorry to tell you, the kitchen floor lit up. A good amount of blood was spilled there. Amy's tap. Be positive, Boney interrupted. And I'm not talking a little cut, I'm talking blood. Oh my god. A clot of heat appeared in the middle of my chest. But, yeah, so your wife made it out of this room. Oh, yeah, so your wife made it out of this room, Gilpin said. Somehow, in theory, she made it into the kitchen without disturbing any of those goo on that table just outside the kitchen. And then she collapsed in the kitchen, where she lost a lot of blood. And then someone carefully mopped it up, Rhonda said, watching me. Wait, wait, why would someone try to hide blood, but then mess up the living room? We'll figure that out, don't worry, Nick, Rhonda said quietly. I, I don't get it, I just don't... Let's sit down, Boney said. She pointed me toward a dining room chair. You eat anything? Want a sandwich? Something? I shook my head. Boney was taking turns playing different female characters, powerful woman, doting caregiver, to see what got the best results. How's your marriage, Nick? Rhonda asked. I mean, five years, that's not far from the seven-year itch. The marriage was fine, I repeated. It's fine. Not perfect, but good. Good. She wrinkled her nose. You lie. You think she might have run off? I asked, too hopefully. Made this look like a crime scene and took off, runaway wife thing? Boney began ticking off reasons no. She hasn't used her cell, she hasn't used her credit cards, ATM cards, she made no major cash withdrawals in the week before. And there's blood, Gilpin added. I mean, again, I don't want to sound harsh, but the amount of blood spilled, that would take some serious... I mean, I couldn't have done it myself. I'm talking some deep wounds there. Your wife got nerves of steel? Yes, she does. She also had a deep phobia of blood, but I'd wait and let the brilliant detectives figure that out. <laughs> it seems extremely unlikely, Gilpin said. If she were to wound herself that seriously, why would she mop it up? So really, let's be honest, Nick. Boney said, leaning over on her knees so she could make eye contact with me as I stared at the floor. How was your marriage currently? We're on your side, but we need the truth. The only thing that makes you look bad is you holding out on us. We've had bumps. I saw Amy in the bedroom that li I saw Amy in the bedroom that last night. Her face mottled with the red hivy splotches she got when she was angry. She was spitting out the words mean, wild words, and I was listening to her, trying to accept the words because they were true, they were technically true, everything she said. Describe the bumps for us, Boney said. Nothing specific, just disagreements. I mean, Amy is a blow stack, she bottles up a bunch of little stuff and, whoom, <laughs> but then it's over. We never went to bed angry. Not Wednesday night? Boney asked. Never, I lied. Is it money, what you mostly argue about? I, I can't even think what we'd argue about, just stuff. What stuff was it the night she went missing? Gilpin said it with a sideways grin, like... Oh, Gilpin. <laughs> what stuff was it the night she went missing? Gilpin said it with a sideways grin, like he'd uttered the most unbelievable gotcha. Like I, I told you, it was... There was the lobster... What else? I'm, I'm sure you didn't scream about the lobster for a whole hour. At that point, Bleeker waddled partway down the stairs and peered through the railings. Other household stuff, too. Married couple stuff. The cat box, I said. H who would clean the cat box? You were in a screaming argument about a cat box? Boney said. You know, the principle of the thing. I work a lot of hours and Amy doesn't, and I... Think it would be good for her if she just did some basic home maintenance, just basic upkeep. Gilpin jolted like an invalid, woken from an afternoon nap. You're an old-fashioned guy, right? I'm the same way. 
I tell my wife all the time, I don't know how to iron, I don't know how to do the dishes, I can't cook, so sweetheart, I'll catch the bad guys, that I can do, and you throw some clothes in the washer now and then. Rhonda, you were married, did you do the domestic stuff at home? Bunny looked believably annoyed. I catch bad guys too, idiot. Gilpin rolled his eyes toward me. I almost expected him to make a joke. Sounds like someone's on the rag. The guy was laying it on so thick. Gilpin rubbed his vulpine jaw. So you just wanted a housewife, he said to me, making the proposition seem reasonable. I wanted... I wanted whatever Amy wanted. I, I really didn't care. I appealed to Boney now, Detective Rhonda Bodie, with the sympathetic air that seemed at least partly authentic. It's not, I reminded myself. Amy couldn't decide what to do here. She couldn't find a job, and she wasn't interested in the bar. Which is fine, if you want to stay home, that's fine, I said. But when she stayed home, she was unhappy too, and she'd wait for me to fix it. It was, it was like I was in charge of her happiness. Boney said nothing, gave me a face expressionless as water. And I mean, it's fun to be hero for a while, be the white knight, but it doesn't really work for long. I couldn't make her be happy. She didn't want to be happy. So I thought if she started taking charge of a few practical things, like the cat box, said Boney. Yeah, clean the cat box, get some groceries, call a plumber to fix the drip that drove her crazy. Wow, that sounds like a real happiness plan there. A lot of yucks. But m my point was, do something. Whatever it is, do something. Make the most of the situation. Don't sit and wait for me to fix everything for you. I was speaking loudly, I realized, and I sounded almost angry, certainly righteous. But it was such a relief. I'd started with a lie, the cat box, and turned that into a surprising burst of pure truth. And I realized why criminals talked too much, because it felt so good to tell your story to a stranger, someone who won't call bullshit, someone forced to listen to your side. Someone pretending to listen to your side, I corrected. So, so, uh, the move back to Missouri, Boney said. You moved Amy here against her wishes? Ag against her wishes? No. We did what we had to do. I had no job. Amy had no job. My mom was sick. I'd do the same for Amy. That's nice of you to say, Boney muttered. And suddenly she reminded me exactly of Amy. The damning, below-breath retorts uttered at the perfect level, so I was pretty sure I heard... So I was pretty sure I heard them, but couldn't swear to it. And I asked what I was supposed to ask. What did you say? Oh, sorry, that's um, him. And I asked what I was supposed to ask. What did you say? She'd always say the same. Nothing. I glared at Boney, my mouth tight, and then I thought, maybe this is part of the plan to see how you act toward angry, dissatisfied women. I tried to make myself smile, but it only seemed to repulse her more. And you're able to afford this. Amy working. N uh, Amy working, not working, whatever. You could swing it financially, Gilpin asked. We've had some money problems of late, I said. When we first married, Amy was wealthy. Like, extremely wealthy. Right, said Boney. Those amazing Amy books. Yeah, they made a ton of money in the 80s and 90s. But the publisher dropped them. Said Amy had run her course. And everything went south. Amy's parents had to borrow money from us to stay afloat. From your wife, you mean? Right, fine. And then we used most of the last of Amy's trust fund to buy the bar. And I've been supporting us since. So when you married Amy, she was very wealthy, Gilpin said. I nodded. I was thinking of the hero narrative, the husband who sticks by his wife through the horrible decline in her family's circumstances. So you had a very nice lifestyle. Yeah, it was great. It was awesome. And now she's near broke and you're dealing with a very different lifestyle than what you married into, what you signed on for. I realized my narrative was completely wrong. Because, okay... <laughs> We've been going over your finances, Nick, and dang, they don't look good. Gilpin started, almost turning the accusation into a concern, a worry. The bar is doing decent, I said. Uh, it, it usually takes a few business three... Uh, it usually takes a, a new business three or four years to get out of the red. It's those credit cards that got my attention, Boney, Boney said. $212,000 in credit card debt. I'm... I mean, it took my breath away. 
she found a stack of red ink statements at me. My parents were fanatics about credit cards, used only for special purposes, paid off every month. We don't buy what we can't pay for. It was the Dunn family motto. We don't... I don't, at least. But, but I don't think Amy would... Can I see those? I stuttered, just as a low-flying bomber rattled the window panes. A plant on the mantel promptly lost five pretty purple leaves. Forced into silence for ten brain-shaking seconds, we all watched the leaves flutter to the ground. I love this. Uh, in the... Um, in the movie, uh, this isn't. They're, they're having this conversation in this location, but the the air the air show practices going on adds so much anxiety to it that I love because it's like this is already a difficult thing that they're going through, and then you add that on top of it. I I, I love that. That's a really nice touch. I wish they had kept that in the movie. Yet this great brawl we're supposed to believe happened in here, and not a pedal was on the floor then. Ooh, Gilpin muttered that, so. Uh, yet this great brawl we're supposed... We're, and yet this great brawl we're supposed to believe happened in here, and not a pedal was on the floor then. Gilpin muttered disgustedly. I took the papers from Boney and saw my name, only my name, versions of it. Nick Dunn, Lance Dunn, Lance N. Dunn, Lance Nicholas Dunn, on a dozen different credit cards. Balances from $62.78 to $45,602.33, all in various states of lateness. Purse threats printed in ominous lettering across the top. Pay now. Holy fuck, this is, like, identity theft or something, I said. They're not mine. I mean... Freaking look at some of this stuff. I, I I don't even golf. Someone had paid over $7,000 for a set of clubs. Anyone can tell you I really don't golf. I tried to make it sound self-effacing. Yet another thing I'm not good at. But the detectives weren't biting. You know Noel Hawthorne? Boney asked. The friend of Amy you told us to check out. Wait, I, I want to talk about the bills because they are not mine. I said. I mean... Please, seriously, we need to track this down. We'll track it down, no problem, Boney said, expressionless. Noelle Hawthorne? Right, I, I told you to check her out because she's been all over my town wailing about Amy. Boney arched an eyebrow. You seem angry about that. No, like I told you, she, she seems a little too broken up, like in a fake way. Ostentatious. Uh, ostentatious? Ostentatious. Attention-seeking. A little obsessed. We talked to Noel, Boney said. Says your wife was extremely troubled by the marriage, was upset about the money stuff, that she worried you'd married her for her money. She says your wife worried about your temper. I, I don't know why Noel would say that. I don't think she and Amy ever exchanged more than five words. That's funny, because the Hawthorne's living room is covered with photos of Noel and your wife. Boney frowned. I frowned too. Actual, real pictures of her and Amy? Boney continued. At the St. Louis Zoo last October, on a picnic with the triplets, on a weekend float trip this past June, as in last month. Amy has never uttered the name Noel in the entire time we've lived here. I'm serious. I scanned my brain over this past June and came upon a weekend I went away with Andy, told Amy I was doing a boy's trip to St. Louis. I'd returned home to find her pink-cheeked and angry, claiming a, claiming a weekend of bad cable and board reading on the dock. And she was on a float trip? No. I, I, I couldn't think of anything Amy would care for less than the typical Midwestern float trips. Uh, beers bobbing in coolers tied to canoes, loud music, drunk frat boys, campgrounds dotted with vomit... Are you sure it was my wife in those photos? They gave each other a he's serious look. Nick, Boney said. We have no reason to believe that the woman in the photos who looks exactly like your wife and who Noel Hawthorne, a mother of three, your wife's best friend here in town, says is your wife is not your wife. 
your wife, who I should say, according to Noel, you married for money. Gilpin added. I'm not joking, I said. Anyone these days can doctor photos on a laptop. Okay, so a minute ago, you were sure Desi Collings was involved, and now you're moved on to Noel Hawthorne, Gilpin said. It seems like you're really casting about for someone to blame. Besides me? Yes, I am. Look, I did not marry Amy for her money. You, you really should talk more with Amy's parents. They know me. They know my character. They don't know everything, I thought, my stomach seizing. Boney was watching me. She looked sort of sorry for me. Gilpin didn't even seem to be listening. You bumped up the life insurance coverage on your wife to 1.2 million, Gilpin said with mock wariness. He even pulled a hand over his long, thin-jawed face. Amy did that herself, I said quickly. The cops both just looked at me and waited. I mean, I filed the paperwork, but it was Amy's idea. She insisted. I swear, I couldn't care less, but Amy said... She said, given the change in her income, it made her feel more secure or something, or it was a smart business decision. Fuck, I don't know. I, I don't know why she wanted to. I didn't ask her to. Two months ago, someone did a... Re uh, someone did a search on your laptop, Boney continued. Body float Mississippi River. Can you explain that? I took deep, I took two deep breaths, nine seconds to pull myself together. God, that was just a dumb book idea, I said. I was thinking about writing a book. Huh, Boney replied. Which is funny because as a writer, yes, I have very sketchy search history because of things that I'm writing. And it's funny that Nick was actually searching for that because he had a book idea that is that they mentioned earlier. That's that's I love that. That's really good uh foreshadowing. Not in the movie, but very good. Look, here's what I think is happening. I began. I think a lot of people watch these new programs where the wife or I'm sorry. I think a lot of people watch these new programs where the husband is always this awful guy who kills his wife, and they are seeing me through that lens, and some really innocent, normal things are being twisted. This is turning into a witch hunt. That's how you explain those credit card bills? Gilpin explained. Or Gilpin asked. I, I told you I can't explain the fucking credit card bills because I have nothing to do with them. It's your fucking job to figure out where they came from. They sat silent, side by side. Waiting. What is currently being done to find my wife? I asked. What leads are you exploring, besides me? The house began shaking. The sky ripped, and through the back window we could see a jet shooting past, right over the river, buzzing us. F-10, Rhonda said. Ah, too small, Gilpin said. It's gotta be. It's an F-10. Boney leaned toward me, hands entwined. It's our job to make sure you are in the 100% clear, Nick, she said. I know you want that too. Now, if you can just help us out with the few little tangles, because that's what they are, they keep tripping us up. Maybe it's time I got a lawyer. The cops exchanged another look, as if they'd settled a bet. Oh my god. Nick, you're looking bad. Oh boy. Oh boy. Love it. Yeah, it's really interesting seeing the differences between um the movie and the book because this is supposed there's a there's a, a twist that happens and then Nick is supposed to say maybe I should get a lawyer or I'm not talking to you guys without a lawyer anymore. So it's interesting that they're pulling it here. That's why you always get a lawyer. To get the lawyer. Amy Elliott Dunn. Oh, Amy Elliot Dunn, October 21st, 2011. Diary entry. Nick's mom is dead. I haven't been able to write because Nick's mom is dead and her son has come unmoored. Sweet, tough Maureen. She was up and moving around until days before she died, refusing to discuss any sort of slowdown. I just want to live until I can't anymore, she said. She'd gotten into knitting caps for other chemo patients. She herself was done, done, done after one round, no interest in prolonging life if it meant more tubes. 
So I'll remember her always surrounded by bright knots of wool, red and yellow and green, and her fingers moving, the needles click-clacking while she talked in her contented cat voice, all deep, sleepy purr. And then one morning in September, she woke and... but didn't really wake, didn't become Maureen. She was a bird-sized woman overnight, that fast, all wrink that fast, all wrinkles and shell, her eyes darting around the room, unable to place anything, including herself. So then came the hospice, a gently lit, cheerful place, with paintings of women in bonnets and rolling hills of bounty and snack machines and small coffees. The hospice was not expected to fix or help her, but just to make sure she died comfortably. And just three days later, she did. Very matter-of-fact, the way Maureen would have wanted it. Although I'm sure she would have rolled her eyes at that phrase, the way Maureen would have wanted it. Her wake was modest, but nice, with hundreds of people. Her look-alike sister from Omaha bustling by proxy, pouring coffee and Baileys, handing out cookies, and telling funny stories about Mo. We buried her on a gusty, warm morning. Go and Nick leaning into each other as I stood nearby, feeling intrusive. That night in bed, Nick let me put my arms around him, his back to me. But after a few minutes, he got up, whispered, Gotta get some air, and left the house. His mother had always mothered him. She insisted on coming by once a week and ironing for us. And when she was done ironing, she'd say, I'll just help tidy. And after she'd left... I'd look in the fridge and find she'd peeled and sliced his grapefruit for him, put the pieces in a snap-top container. And then I'd open the bread and discover all the crusts had been cut away, each slice returned half-naked. I am married to a 34-year-old man who is still offended by bread crusts. I love that. That's a... I... Ooh. Damn. 186. I gotta write that down. Grapefruit, bread crusts. This is cool for y'all to see my, uh, <laughs> how I do videos. I'm just kind of doing the notes. Oh, sorry about those cracks. I didn't mean to put them so close to the, uh, microphone. Oh, boy. And that also shows, um, he's, it's a reminder how old he is. He's, I'm married to a... 34-year-old man. So he's 34 and he's sleeping with a 23-year-old. Which I guess... That isn't that terrible of an age difference. But Nick is immature in a lot of ways. So. Nice cracks. Thank you. I did. I, at least I did some good cracks. Um, let's see. But I tried to do... But I tried to do the same those first weeks after his mom passed. I snipped the bread crusts. I ironed his t-shirts. I baked a blueberry pie from his mom's recipe. I don't need to be- I don't need to be babied, really, Amy, he said, as he stared at the loaf of skinned bread. <laughs> skinned breads. <laughs> I peeled your breads for you. <laughs> I let my mom do it because it made her happy, but I know you don't like that nurturing stuff. So we're back to black squares. Sweet, stoting, loving Nick is gone. Gruff, peeved, angry Nick is back. Ooh, yeah, because that's a sentence. I know you don't like doing that nurturing stuff. Oof. I need to be babied. Yeah, I cut off, but I cut off my own crusts. I don't like the crusts. You are, you are supposed to lean on your spouse in hard times. But Nick seems to have gone even farther away. He is a mama's boy whose mama is dead. He doesn't want anything to do with me. He uses me for sex when he needs to. He presses me against a table or over the back of the bed and fucks me, silent until the last few moments, those few quick grunts, and then he releases me. He puts a palm on the small of my back, his one gesture of intimacy. And he says something that is supposed to make it seem like a game. You're so sexy, sometimes I can't control myself. But he says it in a dead voice. Uh, let's see. 
he uses me for sex when he needs to. Um, that exact sentence, I'm not sure if the following, he presses me up against a table or whatever, uh, is in the movie. So I recognized it immediately. If something is from the movie, sometimes I'll just like go into the voice that she used. Quiz. Your husband, with whom you once shared a wonderful sex life, has turned distant and cold. He only wants sex his way on his time. You, A, withhold sex further. He's not going to win this game. B, cry and whine and demand answers he's not yet ready to give, further alienating him. C, have faith that this is just a bump in a long marriage. He's in a dark place, so try to be understanding and wait it out. Answer C. Right? It bothers me that my marriage is disintegrating and I don't know what to do. You'd think my marriage, uh, you'd think my parents, the double psychologists, would be the obvious people to talk to, but I have too much pride. They would not be good for marital advice. They are soulmates, remember? They are all peaks, no valleys, a single, infinite burst of marital ecstasy. I can't tell them I'm screwing up the one thing I have left, my marriage. They'd somehow write another book, a fictional rebuke in which Amazing Amy celebrated the most fantastic, fulfilling, bump-free little marriage ever. Because she put her mind to it. Ooh, I like that. 186. Hi, Khaleesi. Page 186. Hey, little girl. What's up? Oh, are you hungry for dinner? Would y'all mind if I fed her real quick? Hi. Yeah, it's time for dinner. I was supposed to feed her a couple hours ago, but she wasn't awake. Oh, yo. Yeah. Yeah, you want food? Let's go get you some food. Huh? Mm. Little tiny little beans. Yeah, I'm gonna feed her real quick. Excuse me, Khaleesi. Yeah, yeah, I do. Let's see. It is in the fridge. Oh, you still have some dry food left. Funny. She didn't even ask for food. Um, I'm just gonna uh, hit the bathroom up real quick. Let me. Uh, I'm gonna put the um, scenes. I'm gonna put the bathroom thing on. Uh, I will be right back. Hello. Let's watch those fall in the cup. <laughs> <laughs> 
Let's fucking do it. At the fuck yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's fun. Oh, Felt my water real quick. Ugh. Just taking care of all these little little things while I'm up and about. Because I want to get back into the reading, but I know that I'm gonna need water. Okay. Let's get to it. Can we see what he's doing, maybe? She's doing a weird thing where she paws at the floor. Khaleesi, can you stop that? I don't want that to get picked up by the mic. Khaleesi, baby. I gotta go over and manually stop her. Hey, sweetie. Hey. Hey, we don't have to do that weird thing that you do, okay? <laughs> Thank you. She's so weird. Okay. Sweetie. Hey. Come on. I don't want to stand up again. Thank you. Oh god, okay. <laughs> uh, marriage, okay. But I worry. All the time. I know I'm already too old for my husband's taste. Because I used to be his ideal six years ago. And so I've heard his ruthless comments about women nearing 40. How pathetic he finds them. Overdressed, out at bars, oblivious to their lack of appeal. He'd come back from a night out drinking, and I'd ask him how the bar was, whatever bar, and he'd so often say, totally in yeah, inundated, oh, totally inundated by lost causes, his, his code for women my age. At the time, a girl barely in her 30s, I'd smirked along with him as if that would never happen to me. Now I am his lost cause, and he's trapped with me, and maybe that's why he's so angry. Ooh. Yeah, I'm going to write that down. He has this thing where he just like, yeah. What page is this? 186. Okay, that's the same one. Um, he's just so misogynistic that he can't even fucking like. Ugh. I've been indulging in toddler therapy. I walk over to Noelle's every day and I let uh, and I let her triplets paw at me. The little plump hands in my hair, the sticky breath on my neck. You can understand why women always threaten to devour children. She is just to eat. I could eat him with a spoon. Although watching her three children toddle to her, sleep stained from their nap, rubbing their eyes while they make their way to mama hands touching her knee or arm as if she were home base as if they knew they were safe it hurts me sometimes to watch yesterday i had a particularly needful afternoon at noel's so maybe that's why i did something stupid nick comes home and finds me in the bedroom fresh from a shower and pretty soon and pretty soon he's pushing me against the wall pushing himself inside me when he's done and releases me, I can see the wet kiss of my mouth against the blue paint. I'm trying to figure out... What? The wet kiss of my mouth against the blue paint. Oh, I see. So, like, if your mouth is wet and then you, like, kiss the wall. I see. I thought the paint was wet for a second. As he sits on the edge of the bed, panting, he says, Sorry about that. I just needed you. Not looking at me. I go to him and put my arms around him, pretending what we'd just done was normal, a pleasant marital ritual, and I say, I've been thinking. Yeah, what's that? Well, now might be the right time to start a family, try to get pregnant. I know it's crazy even as I say it, but I can't help myself. I have become the crazy woman who wants to get pregnant because it will save her marriage. It's humbling to become the very thing you once mocked. He jerks away from me. 
Now? Now is about the worst time to start a family, Amy. You have no job. I know, but I'd... I'd want to stay home with the baby anyway at first, so... My mom just died, Amy. And this would be new life. A new start. He grips me by both my arms and looks at me right in the eye for the first time in a week. Amy, I think you think that now that my mom is dead, we'll just frolic back to New York and have some babies, and you'll get your old life back. But we don't have enough money. We barely have enough money for the two of us to live here. You, you can't imagine how much pressure I feel every day to fix this mess we're in, to fucking provide. I can't handle you and me and a few kids. You want to give them everything you had growing up, and I can't. No private school for the little duns, no tennis and violin lessons, no summer houses. You'd hate how poor we'd be. You'd hate it. I'm not that shallow, Nick. You really think we're in a great place right now to have kids? It is the closest we've gotten to discussing our marriage, and I can see he already regrets saying something. We're under a lot of pressure, baby, I say. We've had a few bumps, and I know a lot of it is my fault. I just feel... I just feel so at loose ends here. So we're going to be one of those couples who has a kid to fix their marriage because that always works out so well. We'll have a baby because his eyes go dark, canine, and he grabs me by the arms again. Just no, Amy, not right now. I can't take one more bit of stress. I can't handle one more thing to worry about. I am cracking under the pressure. I will snap. For once, I know he's telling the truth. Back may or may not have been contacting a lady. Oh, very good, Cucumber. <laughs> I feel like that's um a thing that I want to do also when I read this. I see how shitty Nick is and it just makes me want to like appreciate women, <laughs> if that makes sense. I'm like, God, I wish I could just like go down on a woman right now. I just want to make up for like all of the shittiness of Nick done. <laughs> He's put so much shittiness into the world that I just want to, like... <laughs> it's a silly thought, but a, but a valid one. <sighs> Yee. <Yeah. laughs> For real, Nick makes me feel gross, right? It makes me feel gross. It makes me feel gross to be a dude. <laughs> Ooh. Nick done. Six days gone. I wish I could have any intimate contact with a woman, to be honest. Yeah, I, uh, I'm feeling that. I've been, I've been dating a lot of non-binary cuties and a lot of cis dudes recently, and I'm dating is a loose term. Hooking up, I guess? I don't know. It's frustrating because I want to feel the way that I used to, but because... You know, T took away my uh, my ability to feel romantic feelings. You know, I've been hooking up with someone recently who's like amazing. They're an amazing person, and they're doing everything right, and we're clicking on all the right levels. And I know in my heart what I'm supposed to be feeling, but because my emotions have been capped, I'm just literally not able to feel it anymore, and it feels bad. It feels sad, you know, because I'm like, I wish I could fall for this person but it's just not happening yet it's that's it's a bad feeling but uh i'm open to it happening in the future i just i just hope it does i don't think i've dated like a cis woman in like ever i mean i guess women in general i've never dated a trans woman um but i've never but I, uh, the last girl that I dated or hooked up with or any contact at all was like, April. Is it April now? Eight months? Seven months? Seven months. I miss it. Women are nice. <laughs> Women. Women smell nice. Everyone has different tastes and interests change all the time. 
So don't ever do what I did. Don't think of yourself as unlovable. Just keep an eye out for the right person. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I consider myself very lovable. It's just, uh, you know, I wish I could feel love. But, you know, it's, a, it's an actual chemical change that has happened in my body. <laughs> but maybe, you know, it started when I started doing the higher... Uh, I had to switch to bi-weekly injections, which made me hornier and it made my ax my acne uh, a lot worse and it was less easy to cry now i'm kind of maybe sometimes able to tear up which is the most crying action i've had in a long time so maybe going on the once a week dosage is gonna help me to feel that again we'll see Yeah, no, therapy is dope. Uh, therapy. <laughs> I wrote a line in my script the other day that was like, um, therapy or therapists are awesome. They're like, um, oh, what was the line? There's a character who was, oh, oh, actually I did it in uh pink blue episode 11. And then I was like, Ooh, that's a good line. So I wrote it down but you're basically talking about things and your therapist is like this, this, and this. And you're like, Oh, that's me. Uh, and it's kind of like therapists are like an astrology, uh, chart that actually works. <laughs> I found that to be a, a funny line. So I wrote it into a thing, but everyone should be in therapy in my opinion, you know, even if you don't have issues, but all of us have issues. That's the thing. If you're perfect, you definitely need therapy because there's something up with you, you know. Uh, so everyone, everyone should be in therapy, in my opinion. Nick Dunn, six days gone. The first 48 hours are key in any investigation. Amy had been gone now almost a week. A candlelight vigil would be held this evening in Tom Sawyer Park, which, according to the press, was a favorite place of Amy Elliott Dunn's. I never known Amy to set foot in the park, despite the name. It is not remotely quaint. Generic, bereft of trees, with a sandbox that's always full of animal feces. It is utterly untweeny. In the last 24 hours, the story had gone national. It was everywhere, just like that. God bless the faithful Elliot. Mary Beth phoned me last night as I was trying to recover from the bombshell police interrogation. My mother-in-law had seen the Ellen Abbott show and pronounced the woman an opportunist ratings whore. Nevertheless, we'd spent most of today strategizing how to handle the media. The media, my former clan, my people, was shaping its story. And the media loved the amazing Amy Angle and the long-married Elliots. No snarky commentary on the dismantling of the series or the author's near bankruptcy, Right now, it was all hearts and flowers for the Elliots. The media loved them. Me, not so much. The media was already turning up items of concern. Not only the stuff that had been leaked, my lack of alibi, the possibly staged crime scene, but actual personality traits. They reported that back in high school, I never dated one girl longer than a few months, and thus was clearly a ladies' man. They found out we had my father in Comfort Hill and that I rarely visited, and thus I was an ingrate dad abandoner. It's a problem. They don't like you, Go said after every bit of news coverage. It's a real, real problem, Lance. The media had resurrected my first name, which I'd hated since grade school, stifled at the start of every school year when the teacher called, rolled call, uh, called roll call. Uh, it's Nick. I go by Nick. Every September and opening day, right. Nick, I go by Nick. Always some smart-ass kid would spend recess parading around like a... Like a mincing gallant. Hi, I'm Lance. In a flowy... In a flowy, shirted voice. Then it would be forgotten again until the following year. But not now. Now it was all over the news. The dreaded three-named judgments reserved for serial killers and assassins. Lance Nicholas Dunn. And there was no one I could interrupt. Ooh, I love that. I need to write that down. Lance. 
I think I'd already made the note, but I want to make sure. Rand and Mary Beth Elliott go and I carpooled to the vigil together. It was unclear how much information the Elliots were receiving, how many damning updates about their son-in-law. I knew they were aware of the staged scene. I'm going to get some of my own people in there, and they'll tell us just the opposite, that it clearly was the scene of a struggle, Rand said confidently. The truth is malleable, you just need to pick the right expert. Rand didn't know about the other stuff, the credit cards and the life insurance and the blood and no well. My wife's bitter best friend with the damning claims, abuse, greed, fear. She was booked on Ellen Abbott tonight, post-vigil. Noel and, Ellen could, uh, Noel and Ellen could be mutually disgusted by me for the viewing audience. Not everyone was repulsed by me. In the past week, the bar's business was booming. Hundreds of customers packed in to sip beers and nibble popcorn at the place owned by Lance Nicholas Dunn, the maybe killer. Go had to hire four new kids to tend the bar. She dropped by once and said she couldn't go again. Couldn't stand seeing how packed it was. Fucking gawkers. Ghouls all drinking our booze and swapping stories about me. It was disgusting. Still, go reasoned. The money would be helpful if... If. Amy gone six days and we were all thinking in ifs. We approached the park in a car gone silent except for Mary Beth's constant nail drumming on the window. Feels almost like a double date, Rand laughed. The laughter curving toward the hysterical, high-pitched and squeaky. Rand Elliott's genius psychologist, best-selling author, friend to all, was unraveling. Mary Beth had taken to self-medication, shots of clear liquor administered with absolute precision, enough to take the edge off, but stay sharp. Rand, on the other hand, was literally losing his head. I half expected to see it shoot off his shoulders on a jack-in-the-box spring. Cuckoo! Rand's schmoozy nature had turned manic. He got desperately clumsy. He got desperately chummy with everyone he met. Wrapping his arms around cops, reporters, volunteers, he was practically tight with our days-in liaison. Liaison in quotes. A gawky, shy kid named Donnie, whom Rand liked to razz and inform he was doing so. Ah, I'm just razzing you, Donnie, he'd say, and Donnie would break into a joyous grin. Can't that kid go get validation somewhere else? I groused to go the other night. She said I was just jealous that my father figure liked someone better. I was. Mary Beth patted Rand's back as we walked toward the park, and I thought about how much I wanted someone to do that, just a quick touch, and I suddenly let out a gasp sob, one quick teary moan. I wanted someone, but I wasn't sure if it was Andy or Amy. Nick? Go said. She raised a hand toward my shoulder, but I shrugged it off. Sorry. Wow, sorry for that, I said. Weird outburst, very undone -y. No problem, we're both coming undone Go said, and I looked away. Since discovering my situation, which is what we'd taken to calling my infidelity, she'd gotten a bit removed, her eyes distant, her face a constant mull. I was trying very hard not to resent it. As we entered the park, the camera crews were everywhere, not just local anymore, uh, uh, not just local anymore, but network. The Duns and the Elliots walked along the perimeter of the crowd, ran smiling and nodding, like a visiting digni uh, like a visiting dignitary. Digni dignitary? Dignitary, sorry. Boney and Gilpin appeared almost immediately, took to our heels like friendly pointer dogs. They were po they were becoming familiar, furniture, which was clearly the idea. Boney was wearing the same clothes she wore to any public event. A sensible black skirt, a gray-striped blouse, barrettes clipping either side of her limp hair. I got a girl named Boney Maroney. The night was steamy. Under each of Boney's armpits was a dark, smiley face of perspiration. She actually grinned at me as if yesterday the accusations, they were accusations, weren't they? Hadn't happened. The Elliots and I filed up the stairs to a rickety makeshift stage. I looked back toward my twin, and she nodded at me and pantomimed a big breath, and I remembered to breathe. 
Hundreds of faces were turned toward us, along with clicking, flashing cameras. Don't smile, I told myself. Do not smile. Oh, we're talking about relationships. <laughs> yeah, no, role playing is uh is dope for for developing confidence. Uh, for me, it was just going on tea and finding comfort in myself, and that's how I've become more confident. But back before I started tea, I was very not confident with women. Because I only dated women back then. I didn't know I was attracted to anyone else. Uh, but... Yeah, it's all just... If you're playing a character... Like, if I'm playing a character, it's mu it's much easier for me, especially back in the day. Now I can just flirt. But uh, it was a good stepping stone. Uh, women who take the lead, it, it's very attractive. Yeah, because I'm caught... Because I've experienced both sides, I, uh, I know how unnerving it is when a dude flirts with a, a woman and uh, I don't want to be that guy who like is creeping out someone and I don't know it because they could just be being nice just because they are nervous or scared. Uh, and there are lots of douchebags that like flirt with women and then when they're not into it, they like turn aggressive. And I, so I understand the fear, you know. Uh, so I don't want to be that or seem to, I, I want them to be comfortable with me. I want them to tell me to fuck off, you know, if, uh, if I'm being weird, which is why I appreciated Leah in Stardew when we were playing that, where she was like, I have to be honest, I'm not into this. I was like, cool, great, moving on, you know, um, but the issue is I keep getting with a lot of women who want me to take the lead and are, don't communicate that. And that ends poorly because then neither of us are taking the lead. Um, right, so Dick was just saying, don't smile. From the front of dozens of Find Amy t-shirts, my wife studied me. Go had said I needed to make a speech. You need some humanizing fast, so I did. I walked up to the microphone. It was too low, mid-belly, and I wrestled with it a few seconds, and it raised only an inch, the kind of malfunction that would normally infuri infuriate me, but I could no longer be infuriated in public. So I took a breath and leaned down and read the words that my sister had written for me. God, he can't even write his own... <laughs> You're a writer, Nick. <laughs> God. My wife, Amy Dunn, has been missing for almost a week. I cannot possibly convey the anguish our family feels, the deep hole in our lives left by Amy's disappearance. Amy is the love of my life. She is the heart of her family. For those who have yet to meet her, she is funny and charming and kind. She is wise and warm. She is my helpmate and partner in every way. I looked up into the crowd and, like magic, spotted Andy. Khaleesi. Khaleesi, stop making that noise, baby. Hey, come on. I don't want to stand up. Thank you. <laughs> she might start again. I looked up into the crowd and, like magic, spotted Andy, a disgusted look on her face, and I quickly glanced back at my notes. Amy is the woman I want to grow old with, and I know this will happen. Pause. Breathe. No smile. Go had actually written the words on my index card. Yeah, it's all in it's all in caps. Happen, happen, happen. My voice echoed out through the speakers, rolling toward the river. We ask you to contact us with any information. We light candles tonight in the hopes she comes home soon and safely. I love you, Amy. I kept my eyes moving anywhere but Andy. The park sparkled with candles. A moment of silence was supposed to be observed, but babies were crying, and one stumbling homeless man kept asking loudly, Hey, what is this about? What's it for? And someone would whisper Amy's name, and the guy would say louder, What? It's for what? 
From the middle of the crowd, Noel Hawthorne began moving forward, her triplets affixed, affixed on one. Um, from the middle of the crowd, Noel Hawthorne began moving forward, her triplets affixed, one on a hip, the other two clinging to her skirt, all looking ludicrously tiny to a man who spent no time around children. Noel forced the crowds apart for her and the children, marching right to the edge of the podium, where she looked up at me. Khaleesi. She's so weird. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, Daddy doesn't like when you do that. You're weird. Okay. Well, she just ate something off the floor. I hope that was cat food. I think it was. She doesn't like uh, human food. So I'd be very surprised. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Noelle's in the middle of moving forward. Noelle forced the crowd to part for her and the children, marching right to the edge of the podium, where she looked up at me. I glared at her. The woman had maligned me. And then I noticed for the first time the swell in her belly and realized she was pregnant again. For one second, my mouth dropped. Four kids under four. Sweet Jesus. And later that look would be analyzed and debated, most people believing it was a one-two punch of anger and fear. Hey, Nick. Her voice caught in the half-raised microphone and boomed out to the audience. I started to fumble with the mic, but couldn't find the off switch. Oh, that's interesting. There's a typo in here. They used the wrong kind of mic. They did a uh, KE when it's supposed to be C. Usually, that's that's uh, it's a silly mistake to make, so they probably just didn't even notice. I just know because I'm a voice actor. Maybe. Maybe it's not as common as I think. I just wanted to see your face, she said, and burst into tears. A wet sob rolled out over the audience. Everyone rapped. Where is she? What have you done with Amy? What have you done with your wife? Wife, wife, her voice echoed. Two of her alarmed children began to wail. Noelle couldn't talk for a second. She was crying so hard. She was wild, furious, and she grabbed the microphone stand and yanked the whole thing down to her level. I debated grabbing it back, but knew I could do nothing toward this woman in the maternity dress with the three toddlers. I scanned the crowd for Mike Hawthorne, Control your wife, but he was nowhere. Noel turned to address the crowd. I am Amy's best friend, friend, friend. The words boomed out all over the park, along with her children's keening. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, so before, when it said happen, 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 it was the microphone repeating, uh... And I love that effect that it's producing. Because he says, uh, Amy is the woman I want to grow old with, and I know this will happen. And then there's like a couple sentences, and it says, happen, happen, happen in italics. So I read that wrong. That's supposed to be that. I am Amy's best friend. Uh, friend, friend, friend. The words boomed out all over the park along with her children's keening. Despite my best efforts, the police don't seem to be taking me seriously. So I'm taking our cause to this town, this town that Amy loved, that loved her back. This man, Nick Dunn, needs to answer some questions. He needs to tell us what he did to his wife. Boney darted from the side of the stage to reach her, and Noelle turned, and the two locked eyes. Boney made a frantic chopping motion at her throat. Stop talking. His pregnant wife... And no one could see the candles anymore, because the flashbulbs were going berserk. Next to me, Rand made a noise like a balloon squeak. Down below me, Boney put her fingers between her eyebrows as if staunching a headache. I was seeing everyone in frantic strobe shots that matched my pulse. I looked out into the crowd for Andy, saw her staring at me, her face pink and twisted, her cheeks damp. And as we caught each other's eyes, she mouthed, asshole and stumbled back away through the crowd. We should go. Oh, we should go. My, sis my sister suddenly beside me, whispering in my ear, tugging at my arm. 
the cameras flashing at me as I stood like some Frankenstein's monster, fearful and agitated by the villager torches. Flash, flash. We started moving, breaking into two parts, my sister and I fleeing toward Go's car. The Elliot standing with jaws agape on the platform, left behind. Save yourselves. The reporters pelted the questions over and over at me. Nick, was Amy pregnant? Nick, were you upset Amy was pregnant? Me streaking out of the park, ducking like I was caught in hail. Pregnant, pregnant, pregnant. The word pulsing in the summer night in time to the cicadas. Ooh, shit. Damn, damn, damn. Ugh. Let's, uh... Let's do one more. Amy Elliott Dunn. February 15th, 2012. Diary entry. What a strange time this is. I have to think that way, try to examine it from a distance. Ha-ha, what an odd period this will be to look back on. Won't I be amused when I'm 80, dressed in faded lavender, a wise, amused figure swilling martinis, and won't this make a story? A strange, awful story of something I survived. Because something is horribly wrong with my husband. Of that, I am sure now. Yes, he's mourning his mother, but this is something more. It feels directed at me, not a sadness, but... I can feel him watching me sometimes. And I look up and see his face twisted in disgust, like he's walked in on me doing something awful. Instead of just eating cereal in the morning or combing my hair at night. He's so angry, so unstable. I've been wondering if his moods are linked to something physical, one of those weed allergies that turns people mad, or a colony of mold spores that's clogged his brain. I came downstairs the other night and found him at the dining room table, his hands, his head in his hands, looking at a pile of credit card bills. I watched my husband, all alone, under the spotlight of a chandelier. I wanted to go to him to sit down with him and figure it out like partners, but I didn't. I knew that would piss him off. I sometimes wonder if that is at the root of his distaste for me. He's let me see his shortcomings and he hates me for knowing them. He shoved me, hard. Two days ago he shoved me, and I fell and banged my head against the kitchen island, and I couldn't see for three seconds. I don't really know what to say about it. It was more shocking than painful. I was telling him I could get a job, something freelance, so we could start a family, have a real life. What do you call this? He said. Purgatory, I thought. I stayed silent. What do you call this, Amy? Huh? What do you call this? This isn't life, according to Miss Amazing. It's not my idea of life, I said. And he took three ste and he took three big steps toward me, and I thought, he looks like he's going to and then he was slamming me and then he was slamming against me and I was falling. We both gasped. He held his fist in the other hand and looked like he might cry. He was beyond sorry, he was aghast. But here's the thing I want to be clear on. I knew what I was doing. I was punching every button on him. I was watching him coil tighter and tighter. I wanted him to finally say something, do something, even if it's bad, even if it's, even if it's the worst. Do something, Nick. Don't leave me here like a ghost. I just didn't realize he was going to do that. I've never considered what I would do if my husband attacked me, because I haven't exactly run because I haven't exactly run in the wife-beating crowd. I know, lifetime movie, I know. Violence crosses all socioeconomic barriers, but still, Nick? I sound glib. It just seems so incredibly ludicrous. I am a battered wife, amazing Amy and the domestic abuser. He did apologize profusely. Does anyone do anything profusely except apologize? Sweat, I guess. He's agreed to consider counseling, which was something I never thought could happen. Which is good. He's such a good man at his core that I am willing to write it off, to believe it truly was a sick anomaly brought on by the strain we're both under. I forget sometimes that as much stress as I feel, Nick feels, feels it too. He bears the burden of having brought me here. He feels the strain, 
of wanting mopey me to be content, and for a man like Nick, who believes strongly in an up-by-the-bootstraps sort of happiness, that can be infuriating. So the hard shove, so quick, then done, it didn't scare me in itself. What scared me was the look on his face as I lie on the floor blinking, my head ringing. It was the look on his face as he restrained himself from taking another jab, how much he wanted to shove me again, how hard it was not to, how he's been looking at me since, guilt and disgust at the guilt, absolute disgust. Here's the darkest part. I drove out to the mall yesterday, where about half the town buys drugs, and it's as easy as picking up a prescription. I know because Noelle told me. Her husband goes there to purchase the occasional joint. I didn't want a joint, though. I wanted a gun. Just in case. In case things with Nick go really wrong. I didn't realize until I was almost there that it was Valentine's Day. It was Valentine's Day, and I was going to buy a gun and then cook my husband dinner. And I thought to myself, Nick's dad was right about you. You are a dumb bitch. Because if you think your husband is going to hurt you, you leave. And yet you can't leave your husband, who's mourning his dead mother. You can't. You'd have to be a biblically awful woman to do that. Unless something were truly wrong, you'd, you'd have to really believe your husband was going to hurt you. But I didn't really think Nick would hurt me. I just would feel safer with a gun. Oof. Ah... I don't know if I want to keep going or not. Um, let's call it for the night. We're going to call it for the night. Uh, we'll leave it on that. Holy shit. Um, getting really good, y'all. Um, <laughs> stretching. Thank y'all so much for the follows and the subs. Uh, thanks, GeForce, uh, for, for gifting uh, a bunch of people subs. That was super cool. Uh, and Egglag, thank you so much for the bits. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, bits are seldom to come by in the reading streams, but uh, I appreciate it because that's, that's uh, you know, like how I judge streams is like, is it making enough bits that I can justify doing it for this long? Uh, but, you know, a thousand bits, that's like 10 bucks. You know, that's like, hey, hell yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. Panda Smasher. <laughs> You're raiding. Um, <laughs> hell yeah. Oh, fuck. You know what? All right. Um, if y'all are going to stick around, should I do another chapter? What are y'all thinking? Because I was about to wrap up for the night, uh, but, but if people are into it... One more chapter? Yeah, fuck it. You know what? Let's do one. Let's do one more chapter. Uh, Panda, thank you so much for the raid. Um, <laughs> damn. But uh, yeah, as I was, I was saying uh, before the raid happened, uh, a thousand bits. That's like ten bucks to like read. Yeah, fuck yeah. I will read to people during this pandemic. Uh, Panda, pandemic. <laughs> There's a pun somewhere there. Uh, one more chapter? Hell yeah. Okay, let's fucking do it. Uh, if you're just joining us, we're reading Gone Girl, which is one of my favorite books, if not my favorite book. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm, I'm, a, I'm Jesse Nowak. I'm a voice actor, and uh, I want. I've been streaming every other day. I think I've been. I've been streaming a lot lately because of everything that's been going on. I want to be able to like entertain people because that's what I do. Uh, we're about halfway through the book right now. Um, <laughs> Hell yeah, Nightbot's been updated. Panda, pandemic. Yeah, pandas are the best virus. That would be a better version of this virus, huh? I mean, but what if it was still as shitty? What if it was just like pandas causing it? I, I think that'd be at least better. Think of all the memes. Think of all the memes. Oh, dope. Thank you. Uh, loved your role in the uh, the CG pilot T TFS showed off and in Fistmaster. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, that episode of Fistmaster I uh, I wrote with Stefan, which was cool. He tapped me to, to write for it. Um, 
because we knew it was going to be super gay. And I was like, I can do that. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's really cool that people have finally seen Diesel Dust because uh, we've been working on that for like, I think I was cast as Huxley, Huxley in like 2016 or 2015. For, for it to be out now is crazy. Um, you can't see it right now, but there's an old Diesel Dust poster on my wall. Uh, over there and the date on it says uh 2017 at the top that's how long we've been preparing for that um but uh yeah yeah i'm uh i'm a member of team four star i've been a member for the past four years i've been working with team four star for like 10 11 years however long it's been but um yeah i do internet things and uh every other day i have been reading gone girl Pardon me. I'm doing a video on it, so this has been good motivation to, like, you know, read the book. I keep doing the thing where I read a few pages, and then I forget it, and then I go do things. But if I'm actually reading to people, yeah, it's more motivation. Uh, hell yeah, let's do one more chapter. This is, um... God, how do I even... <laughs> Thank you! Yeah, I'm having a good night. I'm having a great night. Um... I was an English major, and I'm a big nerd when I say this, but I love books, uh, and I haven't been able to read recently, so this has been very good to, um, you know, read to people and get input on a book. It's like we're having a class uh, conversation of some kind, which feels neat, um, because I get the best of both worlds. Because I don't like kids, I don't like working with kids, but I do like having discussions about media, so let's fucking do it. How do I even wrap up? Basically, uh, if you haven't been here so far, the chapters switch off between Nick and Amy. Uh, they're a married couple, Amy's gone missing, she's been gone for six days now, and Nick has become the prime suspect in the disappearance. And it's starting to point to murder because there was blood in the uh, the kitchen. And if you've seen the movie Gone Girl, uh, no spoilers. If you can, you know, please keep spoilers out because a lot of people don't actually know what's happening in the book, which is super cool to like see people's first uh, reactions to it. Because I started reading the book, and I was like, how many people have seen the movie or read the book? And it was like no one. And I was like, hell yeah, that's a <laughs> Uh, a clean slate. And Nick is an unlikable piece of shit. So here we go. Nick Dunn. Six days gone. Go pushed me into the car and peeled away from the park. We flew past Noel, who was walking with Boney and Gilpin toward their cruiser, her carefully dressed triplets bumping along behind her like kite ribbons. We screeched past the mob, hundreds of faces of fleshy pointillism of anger aimed right at me. We ran away, basically. Technically. Wow, ambush, Go muttered. Ambush, I repeated, brain stunned. You think that was an accident, Nick? Triple cunt, uh, a triplet cunt already made her statement to the police. Nothing about the pregnancy. Oh, they're doling out bombshells a little at a time? O or there. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> so the C word has been dropped in this book twice so far once is by nick and once is by go that's not a coincidence they are uh they really are just gender men versions of each other they grew up together and it's like this they're okay with calling women that word <laughs> um yeah or they're doling out bombshells a little at a time Boney and Gilpin had already heard my wife was pregnant and decided to make it a strategy. They clearly really believed I killed her. Uh, who is saying this? I can't figure out who's saying this, if it's uh, Go or if it's Nick. I'm going to go with Nick. Or, no, I'm going to go with Go. Noel will be on every cable broadcast for the next week, talking about how you're a murderer, and she's Amy's best friend out for justice. Publicity whore. Publicity fucking whore. I pressed my face against the window, slumped in my chair. Several news vans followed us. We drove silently, Go's breath slowing down. 
I watched the river, a tree branch bobbing its way south. Nick? She finally said. Is it... Uh, do you... I don't know, Go. Amy didn't say anything to me. If she was pregnant, why would she tell Noelle and not tell me? Why would she try to get a gun and not tell you? Go said. None of this makes sense. <sighs> they haven't said it more than that, or maybe it's just been me calling Nick that word. Yeah, I think, um, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure they've only used the C word twice, and it's been Nick... Uh, a couple chapters ago, just getting very angry, and now, now go. <laughs> Let's see. Um, we retreated to Go's. The camera crews would be uh, would be swarming my house, and as soon as I walked in the door, my cell phone rang. The real one. It was the Elliots. I sucked in some air, ducked into my old bedroom, then answered. I need you to an. I need, I need to ask you this, Nick. It was Rand, the TV burbling in the background. I need you to tell me, did you know Amy was pregnant? I paused, trying to find the right way to phrase it, the unlikelihood of a pregnancy. Answer me, goddammit! Rand's volume made me get quieter. I spoke in a soft, soothing voice, a voice wearing a cardigan. Amy and I were not trying to get pregnant. She didn't want to be pregnant, Rand. I don't know if she ever was going to be. We weren't even... We weren't even having relations that often. I'd be very surprised if she was pregnant. Noelle said Amy visited the doctor to confirm the pregnancy. The police already submitted a subpoena for the records. We'll know tonight. I found Go in the living room, sitting with a cup of cold coffee at my mother's card table. She turned toward me just enough to show she, to, uh, to show she knew I was there. But she didn't let me see her face. Why do you keep lying, Nick? She asked. The Elliots are not your enemy. Shouldn't you at least tell them that it was you who didn't want kids? Why make Amy look like the bad guy? I swallowed the rage again. My stomach was hot with it. I'm exhausted, go. God damn, we gotta do this now. We gotta, <laughs> we gotta find a better time? We gotta find a time that's better? I did want kids. We tried for a while. No luck. We even started looking into fertility treatments. But then Amy decided she didn't want kids. It, you told me you didn't. I was trying to put a good face on. Oh, I was trying to put a good face on it. Oh, awesome. Another lie. Go said. I didn't realize you were such a... What are you saying, Nick? It makes no sense. I was there at the dinner to celebrate the bar, and Mom misunderstood. She thought you guys were announcing that you were pregnant, and it made Amy cry. Well, I can't explain everything Amy ever did, Go. I don't know why a fucking year ago she cried like that, okay? Go sat quietly, the orange of the street light creating a rock star halo around her profile. This is going to be a real test for you, Nick, she murmured, not looking at me. You've always had trouble with the truth. You always do the little fib if you think it will avoid a real argument. You've always gone the easy way. Tell mom you went to baseball practice when you really quit the team. Tell mom you went to church when you were at a movie. It's some weird compulsion. This is a very, this is very different from baseball, Go. It's a lot different. But you're still fibbing like a little boy. You're still desperate to have everyone think you're perfect. You, you never want to be the bad guy. So you tell Amy's parents she didn't want kids. You don't tell me you're cheating on your wife. You swear the credit cards are in your name like they aren't yours. You swear you were hanging out at a beach when you hate the beach. You swear your marriage was happy. I, I just don't know what to believe right now. You're kidding, right? Since Amy disappeared, all you've done is lie. It makes me worry about what's going on. Complete silence for a moment. Go, are you saying what I think you're saying? Because if you are, something has fucking died between us. Remember that game you always played with mom when we were little? Would you still love me if... Would you still love me if I smacked Go? Would you still love me if I robbed a bank? Would you still love me if I killed someone? I said nothing. My breath was coming too fast. I would still love you, Go said. Go, do you really need me to say it? 
She stayed silent. I did not kill Amy. She stayed silent. Do you believe me? I asked. I love you. She put her hand on my shoulder and went to her bedroom, shut the door. I waited to see the light go on in the room, but it stayed dark. Two seconds later, my cell phone rang. This time it was the su this time it was the disposable cell that I needed to get rid of and couldn't because I always, always had to pick up for Andy. Once a day, Nick. We need to talk once a day. I realized I was grinding my teeth. I took a breath. Far out on the edge of town were the remains of an old west fort that was now yet another park that no one ever went to. All that was left was the two-story wooden watchtower, surrounded by rusted swing sets and teeter-totters. Andy and I had met there once, groping each other inside the shade of the watchtower. I did three long loops around town in my mom's old car to be sure I was not tracked. It was madness to go. It wasn't yet ten o'clock, but I had but I had no say in our rendezvous anymore. I need to see you, Nick, tonight, right now, or I swear to you I will lose it. As I pulled up to the fort, I was hit by the remoteness of it and what it meant. Andy was still willing to meet me in a lonely, unlit place, me, the pregnant wife killer. As I walked toward the tower through the thick, scratchy grass, I could just see her outline in the tiny window of the wooden watchtower. She is going to undo you, Nick. I quick stepped the rest of the way. Oh, that's interesting. Undo you. Let me go back to the beginning. Now, I wonder if that's a parallel or not, because in the first chapter, the first two paragraphs, is him talking about unspooling his wife's brain. So I wonder if that's, you know, related. An hour later, I was huddled in my... Oh, wait. Yeah, okay. An hour later, I was huddled in my paparazzi-infested house, waiting. Rand said they'd know before midnight whether my wife was pregnant. When the phone rang, I grabbed it immediately, only to find it was goddamn Comfort Hill. My father was gone again. The cops had been notified. As always, they made it sound as if I were the jackass. If this happens again, we're gonna have to terminate your father's stay with us. I had a sickening chill. My dad moving in with me, two pathetic, angry bastards. It would surely make for the worst buddy comedy in the world. The ending would be a murder-suicide. Ba-dum-dum. Cue the laugh track. I was getting off the phone, peering out the back window at the river. Stay calm, Nick. When I saw a huddled figure down by the boathouse. I thought it must be a stray reporter, but then I recognized something in those bald fists and tight shoulders. Comfort Hill was about a thirty-minute walk straight down River Road. He somehow remembered our house when he couldn't remember me. I went outside into the darkness to see him dangling a foot over the bank, staring into the river. Less bedraggled than before, although he smelled tangy with sweat. Dad, what are you doing here? Everyone's worried. He looked at me with dark brown eyes, sharp eyes, not the glazed milk color some elderly require. It would have been less disconcerting if they'd been milky. She told me to come, he snapped. She told me to come. This is my house. I can come whenever I want. You walked all the way here? I can come here any time. You may hate me, but she loves me. I almost laughed. Even my father was reinventing a relationship with Amy. A few photographers on my front lawn began shooting. I had to get my dad back to the home. I could picture the article they'd have to cook up to go along with this exclusive footage. What kind of father was Bill Dunn? What kind of man did he raise? Good God, if my dad started in on one of his harangues against the bitches, I dialed Comfort Hill, and after some finagling, they sent an orderly to retrieve him. I made a display of walking him gently to the sedan, murmuring reassuringly as the photographers got their shots. My dad. I smiled as he left. I tried to make it seem very proud, son. 
The reporters asked me if I killed my wife. I was retreating to the house when a cop car pulled up. It was Boney who came to my house, braving the paparazzi, to tell me. She did it kindly, in a gentle, fingertip voice. Amy was pregnant. My wife was gone with my baby inside her. Boney watched me, waiting for my reaction, to make it part of the police report. So I told myself, act correctly, don't blow it, act the way a man acts when he hears this news. I ducked my head into my hands and muttered, Oh God, oh God. And while I was doing it, I saw my wife on the floor of our kitchen, her hands around her belly and her head bashed in. Oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, let's, uh, let's call it for then. And then we'll start on an Amy chapter for once. Next, uh, next stream. Oh, thank y'all so much. Um, thanks again for, uh, Panda Smasher, thank you so much for the raid if you're still here. Uh, Egglag, thank you again for the beats, and thank you all for the, the subs and the gifting of the subs. G Forest, that was dope. Um, and thank you for the followers. Really appreciate it. I think I'm, um... You might need to check below for the stream schedule, but I believe I'm streaming uh, again in a day. Today's Sunday, technically. Yeah, today's Sunday, technically Monday, but um, I believe I'll be streaming again on Tuesday. Let me double check real quick. I'm going to go to my Twitch page real quick. Hopefully my audio doesn't start playing. It's not good. <laughs> um... Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday, 9 o'clock, we're going to do another Gone Girl. I want to get back to Stardew, so hopefully we're able to, you know. Uh, I mean, we're like, we're making really good progress with the book. We are, yeah, we're halfway through. This has been super fun. Thank you all for indulging me. Uh, this has been super fucking fun. Ah, damn, you just got here. I was, yes, I was, uh, I was reading Gone Girl. Um, we're going to be, we're halfway through the book. We're going to be reading, uh, again, Tuesday, Tuesday, today is technically Monday, but, uh, yeah, I've been streaming, uh, every other day we've been reading Gone Girl. We're making great progress on it. We're halfway through, um, I'm doing a video on it. So this is like, I was telling people it's good motivation for me to actually get the, the fucking shit done. But, uh, yeah, if you, um, <laughs> that's a great idea. Appreciate it. Uh, if you want to follow, you will get a notification when we're streaming next. If not, you can check below for the stream schedule. But, uh, yeah, again, thank you all so much for joining me. This has been super fucking fun and a great exercise for me to stretch my voice acting legs because I haven't been auditioning for shit, uh, in a, in a minute. Good morning, Jesse. Hello. Thank you. Good, good, good morning to you too. Uh, it was fun. Yeah, this has been very different and very interesting. Uh, like I said, I want to get back to Stardew, uh, and we do need to finish Life is Strange 2, but I do want to, like, get through Gone Girl so that I can work on my video in my downtime. Uh, but yeah, thank y'all so much. I will see y'all in two days. Pew, pew. Oh, I fat-fingered. You fat-fingered the, uh, <laughs> goof, goof morning. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Later, uh, everyone, have a good night. Wash your hands. Be safe. Be gentle with yourselves. I will talk to you in a couple days. Bye, folks.